there. Let me know. We're good to go. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the January Marine Fish Advisory Commission meeting. Uh, we're going to review. I need review and approval of the January 21st business meeting agenda. I'll need a motion on this. Or if there are any changes to be made, please speak up. Motion to approve the agenda, Bill Doyle. Thank you, Bill. I need a second. Suki, is that a second? Yeah, that's right, Jared. Okay. Uh, there's no opposition. Not seeing any opposition, Mr. Chair. So moved. Okay, review and approval of the December 2nd draft business meeting minutes. Anybody have any edits? A little here, I do. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Well, you recognize. Thank you. Uh, uh, on page eight of the minutes, uh, there's a word that changes the meaning of this meaning of this uh, the sentence. If you go down to the bottom under presentations, and I'll, I guess Jared, if you're, you're the one who's going to be recording this, it says Khalil Bogdan asked that 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 next to last paragraph. It says Khalil Bogdan asked about where to find the graphs from. That word from should be changed to similar to, not from. Because I already had the, the, the September 18th graphs. Okay. I just, so that from should be changed to similar to. Okay, I'll just make change, that change. Minor change, changes the meaning though. Yep. Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you, Khalil. Any other edit from members? No, no. Was that a yes? Hands raised, Mr. Chair. Okay, I'll need a motion. I need a motion to review and approve the December minutes. Khalil here, move the motion. Thank you, Khalil. Seconded by. Shelly, second it. Thank you, Shelly. So moved. All right, moving on. Any objections? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, moving on to comments, uh, I'd like to compliment the members who have uh, listened in on our public hearings. We've had a number of public hearings like every week since uh, the holiday season and informational sessions. We had a two-day informational session with the Mid-Atlantic on Mackerel. So I'd like to thank those members who attended those meetings. Uh, it's Good to know what we're voting on and what's coming down the pipeline as far as management decisions are concerned. So thank you very much for that. And I'd also like to remind commission members of Jared's email about the ethics renewal and the commission member uh, reappointments. Uh, we sent an email out a few weeks ago about both those subject matter. So please do your ethics. if. if if you're so inclined or you do, it's, you have to do your ethics every two years. And I know Ron is trying to get everybody reappointed. Uh, so submit your paperwork for reappointment. And that's all I have. And I'll turn it over to Commissioner Ron Amden. I'm happy to hear your voice, Commissioner. Yes, thank you, Chairman uh, Kane. I really appreciate uh, you're recognizing the, the paperwork snuffle that kind of was going on. Uh, and I want to particularly reach out to Jared uh, and thank him for his assistance in uh, organizing all of that and, and trying to keep all of you folks organized as well. Um, there, there is some movement now. We're beginning to see that all flow through. As you can imagine, um, with this administration not rerunning, uh, the boards and commissions department is uh, is very, very busy right now at this time of year, trying to ensure that all of the boards and commissions are filled prior to the end of the year. So there's a lot of catch up going on. But uh, I'm confident that uh, all of you folks will be reappointed. It just uh, work closely with Jared to make sure that the background checks uh, are cleaned up and, and on file, uh, as well as the ethics statements. And um, I would hope that this will all be completed in the course of this next month. Um, I also uh, want to uh, 
make specific notice that uh, I have been following all of the work that you folks are doing. Uh, Dan and his crew make sure that I'm copied on all of that. And um, if I were to try to read each and every item that you folks have been working on, it would be the only thing I do. Uh, so I, I have noticed how busy you folks are and I really appreciate it. Um, I would also uh, like to uh, give particular notice to the environmental police. Um, I know they've been busy uh, out there. I've, I've got some phone calls and some texts and emails from uh, four very humble duck hunters down in Chatham. Um, they were particularly appreciative of the fact that their boat went down a few days ago. Um, Harbor Master found out about it right away. Harbor Master came out and scooped their sorry butts out of the water. They, they were literally three of them in the water, one of them clinging to the stern. Dogs swimming free, guns gone, decoys gone, everything gone. And uh, somehow over the course of three days, MEP was able to uh, help them salvage most of their gear. And more importantly, uh, ensure that uh, they weren't further humiliated other than their obvious poor choice of going out in bad weather. So uh, lots of good things going on out there by all of these folks. Uh, and I just wanna say thank you to everybody. And I'll turn it back over to you, Chairman. Thank you, Commissioner. Any questions for Commissioner Ron Amidon? Not seeing any hands raised, Mr. Chair. Okay, we'll move on to law enforcement. Who's on today, Lieutenant Bass? Yes, sir. Good morning, Mr. Chairman. Um, um, well, starting off, it sounds like we got some, uh, I just got some good news from Jared regarding uh, the Gosnell lobster trawl rule has just been rescinded. <clears throat> it might not affect a lot of people, but for us, it's just been a chronic problem. Lots of complaints. The bounds of the, the area were hard to define and, and enforce. So that, that's, a. Uh, I think we're all glad to hear that that's uh, no longer um, also talking with Jared uh, recently, I think we're having some industry complaints and some uh, issues with uh, our sea scallop shucking in state waters is uh, generating some some issues. So I think we're uh, I think that's on our agenda to to discuss, maybe try to, to remedy that. And uh, with that, we are busy with them. I, we're looking still at kind of record prices for scallops. Uh, lobsters are through the roof. Um, keep, you know, issues with those keeping us busy as well as uh, the commissioner mentioned uh, our, our duck hunting friends are certainly um, keeping us busy. Um, in the bay, we still removing some gear and we did a stumble across, I think the first right whales um, seen so far. So they're, uh, I guess, officially back. Um, as far as staffing hiring, I think we just had one start in the academy. I think there's another one pending very soon. We're also looking, I think, at three, possibly four, replacing some of our um, um, COVID, you know, vaccine requirement um, people that left. And then uh, I'm hearing positive rumors about uh, another group possibly going to be hired uh, in the next fiscal year. Um, with that, I have nothing else. I'll take any questions. Questions for Lieutenant Bass. Captain Clayton. Captain Clayton. Good morning, everyone. And um, thank you, Lieutenant, for those comments. Um, to the commissioner, we're happy to help where we can. And uh, there's, a, yeah, some, some of the officers actually went out on the beach yesterday morning trying to recover some of that, that gear from, the, from those, uh, um, those hunters. So we appreciate the heads up and, uh, we're glad to help where we can. And that would be it. Yes, I, I guess I can confirm that uh, generally we're looking to possibly hire 10 in the next fiscal year, um, which are we're in dreadful need of uh, their their presence. So as you know, so that would be it. Thank you all. Happy New Captain year. Clayton, is that in addition to existing officers or is there some amount of backfilling with those 10 hires? I, I believe these would be new. Not a, not a backfill. This would be. Well, that's um, great news. Yep, agreed. That's my understanding as well. <clears throat> you know, the the three the three uh, we had um, we had a retirement. We had a couple uh, um, <clears throat> also left because of the, the COVID issue. I'm sure the retirement was in part because of the COVID issue as well. But um, 
it's my understanding that we are authorized to backfill those three positions immediately. And interviews are underway to do so. So any other questions? If not, I have a question. So you're talking about backfilling positions, but you're also talking about bringing on 10 new recruits for interviewing and sending them for the schooling. Am I to understand that correctly? Yes, sir, but none of that, the only, the only thing we're concerned about right now is replacing those three that have gone in the past four months or so. Okay, so, but the appropriations, uh, the money is there to keep recruiting, I mean, We've been that's, that's, that's my understanding of it, sir. I don't know more than um, essentially that conversations that we're looking to do 10 more in the next fiscal year. I don't know if the money's there already or if it's planned, but that's that's my understanding of it. So, and I don't think so who would have a good feel for this, Pat? Yes, sir. Yeah, okay. Thank you very much. Well, that's... We've been, as you well know, uh, Captain, we've been submitting a letter annually to our legislature, you know, to the House up on the Hill about uh, <clears throat> funding to get the OLE force back up to uh, numbers that they can actually enforce regulations as opposed to having a skeleton crew, which we've had for years. And uh, I know, I know both fishermen and hunters alike who have good rapport with OLE officers and they like to see him down around the shore and talk to him. So, okay, enough said. Any other questions for the captain or the lieutenant? I'm not seeing any hands raised, Mr. Chair. Okay, we'll move this along to a director, Dan McKiernan. Dan? Dan, you're muted. Yeah, I got it. Thank you. Uh, okay, everyone. Um, thank you and good morning. And uh, I'd like to thank the commission for agreeing to slide this meeting uh, over to Friday to accommodate some of the schedules uh, among the commission members. So there's been a lot going on since our last meeting in December. Uh, Jared, do you have the, uh, the slide of the plate? Give me a moment. Sure. There you go. <laughs> Finally, <laughs> the plate has arrived. After over three years of work, uh, the striper conservation plate has finally uh, been issued. Uh, if you recall back in 2018, we were in discussions with the Mass Environmental Trust. In 2019, we created an MOU. And I think that was about the time that you know, Ron had just come on and uh, he was instrumental in helping us get that done. Um, and it's an MOU between us uh, in the department division and the MET to dedicate these funds to striped bass and river herring uh, uh, causes, uh, mostly uh, research uh, and education. And so um, there's going to be a five member panel that I'm gonna appoint uh, soon. Of course, we're, we're, the money, there's no money quite yet. Uh, we're going to get uh, $40 every two years per plate. Uh, I believe we have about a thousand plates right now, and the RMV is busy trying to get these plates into the hands of the pre-registrants, and there'll be a press release shortly. So uh, when you go to the registry, you can, uh, when you choose your plate, you can uh, choose this among the many, and we know there's, there's a ton of plates, and I guess that's one of the challenges. You can get a plate for so many things. I mean, there's a Red Sox plate and a Bruins plate and a and a right whale plate. And I would add that this is a mass environmental trust plate. This would be their fourth. The, the first and most popular is the right whale plate followed by the brook trout. Um, and then there's one for the Blackstone Valley uh, uh, water wheel, but um, I don't think it's uh, all that popular. And now this fourth one is new, uh, and, but it, unlike the other three, it's gonna be dedicated uh, to more specific projects. So um, we're really thrilled with that and we wanna thank the environmental trust and of course all the people in the background that worked on this including the general counsel at the department right now jennifer sula i know uh, she was instrumental in that and this goes all the way back to matt beaton when he was the uh, secretary so 
thanks to everybody for that. Um, our licensing team has been busy uh, issuing permits and because of the uh, supply chain issues with uh, you know, paper and envelopes, we weren't able to get all the permits out on time. So we did extend all 2021 permits an extra month uh, through the end of this month. Uh, DMF shellfish program is working uh, diligently on salving, salvaging the shellfish constables training course which by law and by tradition has been held in person over a two week period uh, every other year at the Mass Maritime Academy. Uh, but because of the pandemic, the course is gonna be offered virtually and uh, the staff have been working with the Mass Shellfish Officers Association to develop this uh, new approach, which is gonna include a series of Zoom calls much like we're on today. And Jared and, and Julia are going to be assisting uh, the team as they, they're, they're really good at, at, at managing these meetings, at least to get them up and running. Uh, I expect they'll do a good job with that as they always do. Um, and I have to tell you, I, I attended a meeting, a virtual meeting of the Middle Atlantic Council in a mackerel meeting. And uh, for so many reasons, uh, it was, uh, it was a, a very difficult meeting. It was uh, not well managed. And it really made me appreciate the work that goes into managing our meetings. Um, and, and we do get a lot of positive uh, feedback on the conduct of our meetings. So thanks to all, especially Jared and Julia for that. Um, our public hearings were held on January 6th and you'll be voting on some of those items today. Um, we did get some good feedback on some of those core issues, although the attendance uh, really wasn't that great, but uh, we can work on that in the future. Also regarding DMS public forums, we held a unique uh, first ever informational meeting on the potential issuance of a letter of authorization for the deployment of ropeless lobster trap fishing, uh, also known as on-demand buoy lines. DMF uh, doesn't have a formal procedure for the issuances of, of LOAs, uh, but National Marine Fisheries Service does. They, they put all of their proposals into the federal register. And so I felt this, we needed a more formal process or at least a more public process. So that meeting was our attempt at enhancing the transparency and also with the education about the topic and the details of the particular request. It was a very well attended meeting with over a hundred participants. And we're gonna be discussing that briefly under the protected species update. And finally, as Matt Bass um, mentioned earlier, we got word yesterday that when the governor signed uh, a recent uh, spending bill, there was an outside section that eliminated the Gosnold single lobster buoy, uh, buoy line uh, mandate that was embedded in uh, chapter 130, section 37. It was the only rule left in state waters where single uh, lobster traps was required meaning uh, multiple pod trawls were banned. And that was especially challenging for Matt, for the enforcement officers, as Matt mentioned, because the, the delineation of what constitutes the town of Gosnold, so if those who aren't familiar, Gosnold is the Elizabeth Island chain from just off of Woods Hole all the way to the tip of Cuddyhunk, and that's considered the town of Gosnold. And it's an area that's uh, that's got a lot of, uh, uh, it's, you know, good geology for the lobster habitat. It's a terminal, terminal moraine, it tends to be rocky. And so single lobster trap fishing is, is a pretty popular thing to do there, but it also results in a proliferation of buoy lines, which we think is unnecessary, given that we're doing what we can to uh, minimize the potential for entanglements. So um, after many years, uh, at least 12, I'd say, uh, this has been accomplished and we're really pleased with that. We'll be putting out an advisory on that uh, probably uh, by Monday. So I'll take any questions, uh, if anybody has any questions for me, uh, but we have a, a pretty full agenda and I'm sure we'll be speaking about a bunch of issues today. So I'll take any questions on, on the items I've presented. Questions for the director. Okay. Yeah, Dan, just a minute. Uh, Thank you, Jared. Uh, this Gosnell thing has been going on. I've been involved with MLA, you know, issues around the state forever, it seems like. And this Gosnell thing has gone on forever. I'm glad to see it finally come to fruition. A couple of guys have been uh, chirping about this for years and years and years. So it's, it's great that it's finally got passed. Thanks. You're welcome. Thank you. 
Thank you, Suki. Other questions for the director? I'm seeing any other hands raised, Mr. Chair. Seeing no other hands raised. We're gonna move into action items and we've got six different action items before us today. So as we go through each of them, we'll see the proposal, we'll have discussion, then I'll ask for a motion, uh, which will be followed by discussion before we vote. So please, when we do vote, there will be a yay or a nay. <clears throat> Any other discussion should occur during the discussion prior to the motion being made and voted on. So we can move this along to uh, the, uh, all right, so what so you got. So we've got new trap right? and buoy line requirements. So. Okay. So Ray, um, Bob Glenn is going to uh, cover the details of this. It's a key part of our uh, manage our uh, strategy for the application of the incidental take permit. And I'll let Bob take it from there. I don't want to steal any of his thunder. Thank you, Dan. Uh, good morning. Good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you, Mr. Commissioner or Mr. Chair. Um, so this buoy line marking rule uh, goes back to um, work that we did last year and the, and the commission approved relative to marking um, lobster gear in a way that is distinctly unique from all other gear, uh, specifically other, other jurisdictions and other gear types. Um, and this relates to us being able to do so in a fashion that makes us distinctly unique from um, all other jurisdictions. Uh, so as you all know, we, we're currently in the process of working on our incidental date permit. Um, and uh, we're going, you know, things are moving along very well. Um, successful ITP application distinguishes state waters fisheries from similar fisheries in other jurisdictions and mitigates all potential sources of risk in endangered species for endangered species. And this is kind of what we've kind of worked towards over the last year and a half, couple of years. Um, and that last year, as I said, the commission um, put in the distinct gear marking rules for, specifically for lobster. And in June, 2021, the, this commission, um, DMF adopted new buoy line marking regulations um, and these go into effect this coming February. These, whoop. Sorry, Jared, okay. Yep. Sorry about that, uh, Jared moved the slides. I wasn't quite ready. Um, these, these rules along with expanded trap gear closures areas and weak line regulations were adopted to provide additional conservation to right whales. Uh, DMF requested um, to the, made a request to the National Marine Fisheries Service to distinguish the, the, the mass lobster fishery separate from the Northeast lobster trap fishery. Um, and we're hope in, in, in last fall in, in National Marine Fisheries Service uh, put forward a um, the proposed list of fisheries, which included Massachusetts listed separately as the uh, Massachusetts trap pot gear fishery, a mixed species trap pot, pot gear fishery, which included uh, the lobster fishery, the whelk fishery, as well as the fish pot fishery. Next slide. And so um, we, we put these rules into place that were specifically made mass gear marking different than all uh, other jurisdictions. And that included for Massachusetts gear, state waters gear, that included a three foot mark in the top 12 feet of the buoy line, and then four additional uh, two foot marks in the um, the, the bottom of the, the buoy line, which the first, the top 50% had two marks and the bottom 50% had two marks. Uh, and along those lines, um, what we found in, in the past year that there was an inconsistency among state and federal gear marking regulations. Uh, and so that was, we, excuse me. Um,
right so uh, the 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 <laughs> the um the state gear marking versus the federal gear marking rules were uh, were slightly different in that uh in federal waters um it was not required to um uh, excuse uh i need a second excuse me Okay. Um, hey, Ray, I've just I've got a request from uh, Bob to, to resume his presentation now. So what, what Bob was getting at is that the, uh, the federal regulations and the state regulations had a slight incompatibility that is described in, in this particular image where uh, as a result of, of uh, the interpretation of the federal regs, it would be conceivable that one of the red marks may not on the line may not have a companion green mark, and so what we want to do is 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 alter the the state rules to be very specific that that every uh, every red mark that is being that is that is um, uh, on the buoy line when put into the federal zone would have to have a companion green mark, and so um, this this is. Uh, a, a pain in the butt for most fishermen. Uh, we recognize that, but it also gets at this uh, very thorny issue that we're dealing with, uh, which was really the focus of a lot of the court cases that we've been dealing with about uh, the attribution of the of the entanglement to a specific location, whether it be state or federal waters, and the jurisdiction that that is basically permitting or licensing that that activity, and so. The objective here is for us to achieve an incidental take permit. Those who are reviewing our application uh, want to be able to know for sure that there would be a, a clear uh, attribution so that any state waters entanglements uh, would be uh, recognized as such. And any entanglements that show up in state waters uh, if coming from outside of state waters could also be attributed appropriately. Uh, for example, you know, these entanglements may come from a snow crab fishery in Canada or any uh, fixed gear fishery from outside of Massachusetts. We know that many right whales come into our state waters uh, on a seasonal basis. Uh, many, whole, uh, many can carry entangling lines for months, if not years. So that in essence, uh, you know, is the proposal. Um, are there any uh, questions that I can take at this time? And, and Jared, I think you're also well versed in this. Yeah, Dan, there's one additional aspect of the proposal, which is that with the list of fisheries um, pending publication of NOAA's list of fisheries, they had in their draft publication, they had listed our all our commercial pot fisheries as a single Massachusetts mixed species pot trap fishery. Mm -hmm. which separates us out from the other jurisdictions, but some of the comments they received on that were that we had not yet implemented a unique gear marking scheme for our fish pot or conch pot fisheries. Um, and <clears throat> since all our commercial trap fisheries could be listed separately as a single and separate um, Massachusetts mixed species pot trap fishery, then it makes sense to apply the gear marking rules that would currently apply just to the lobster and crab fishery to the um, these other trap fisheries as well. Right. So that would so those are the combined recommendations is to clean yeah. up the marking rules so that uh, any remnant red marks, all red marks in buoy lines fish in the federal zone have a corresponding green mark, and that all green marks are removed from the buoy line when uh, there, that buoy line set in state waters, so the state waters gear only has red marks, 
and then have that all have the state waters marking scheme applied to all our commercial trap fisheries. Mm -hmm. and, and Jaron, if I could add, the reason we didn't get this uh, right the last time is that we were reacting to the lobster fishery specific uh, proposed uh, amendments under the large whale take reduction plan. That was phase yeah, this, one. This, this whole process has been pretty dynamic and that we're, we were responding to both the federal and large whale take reduction plan and then NOAA's list of fisheries and, and our work to try to get these things done and the incidental take permit application hasn't always been on schedule with the promulgation of federal rules. Right, but what I wanted to say was in the federal system, uh, two, two to three years ago, lobster was the focus. So we got out ahead and we enacted the lobster rules. Phase two was going to be gill nets and fish pots and whelk pots. That's going on now. But in order to earn our ITP, the, the reviewers looked at this and said, uh, or, you know, that, that Massachusetts should in, uh, amend this marking scheme to include those, even though the, the rules have not yet been uh, proposed for those other fisheries. This, but you care, it's right, this is about the ITP. So I apologize for any confusion on that, but um, I, I think overall it's a pretty straightforward uh, proposal in that we're talking about uh, requiring a second green mark and also extending this, this uh, all the gear marking, uh, our buoy line marking scheme uh, to the, to the uh, fish and, and well pot fisheries, which are primarily south of the Cape. Yeah. So, go ahead. I have a question, Dan. Mm-hmm. So what happens in Nantucket Sound where you've got the, uh, the donut hole? Uh, will they go with state markings or federal markings? Yeah, uh, under the, 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 the Magson Act, when Congress gave uh, the Commonwealth Fisheries Management Authority in the donut hole, uh, for all these species, we assume that that, that is considered state uh, jurisdiction. And so it would be the state, because uh, it wouldn't need a federal mark in the donut hole. Thank you, Dan. Yeah. Dan, and I would just add that, you know, public comments seem to uh, be, be, be largely supportive of this proposal. Yeah. Um, Ray, would you like to take comments at this point? Comments and questions? Yeah, please. Comments or <laughs> questions for uh, the director on this or for Jared, whoever's running this show here? Um, yeah, you can take them to me and Jared combined, but I'll, I'll take the lead. Go ahead. Suki? Yeah, thanks, Jared. Ray. Uh, Dan, we need some clarification. If you go back to the, I must the second slide, maybe about the descriptions of what the buoy colors are. Yeah. It says one solid red mark, and then it says at least four solid or non solid red marks. If you look at the pictures, it doesn't depict the top mark is being solid or, you know, any different than any other marks, but what does solid red mean? Dan, this is Bob Glenn. I, I can um, okay. attempt to answer that. I can answer this question. So the, the solid red on the top three foot mark refers to um, a, a continuous mark. So in that case, like a, a tracer would not be acceptable. Um, it needs to be solid. So in that case, it would be a, a piece of a solid piece of red rope put uh, woven into that section. It could be a um, heat shrink tube melted over the top of that line that's solid. It could be paint, um, but not a twine that is like non-solid where it's, you, you know, whatever the base color of the rope that the twine is, is kind of webbed in, in and out of it. So it, it solid means it, it needs to be kind of view, viewed from 360 degrees. You can see, clearly see the red color. All right. I just, that's been a gray area, I thought. So this guy's been asking me and uh, what about having a piece of, red rope coming off would be buoy line. So, you know, it's like floating free attached to the buoy line. Is that all right? Um, I, I think to be fully compliant, it, it, it would need to be 
uh, tucked in on both ends of the line. So if it's just free floating, like a, a strip of line that's just tucked in at one spot, that would not be sufficient. But if it's tucked in at, at both its, you know, both ends of that piece of three foot piece, that would be sufficient. Okay, uh, we need some. We need to get that information out better. Then I guess. All right, thanks for that, Bob. And Bob, do we have plans for some like uh, educational training on how to comply with this? Uh, yes, we we definitely do. Um, I was uh, just met with staff yesterday. We're planning outreach events. A um, couple of different things. Uh, we do have additional red rope um, that we're going to. Um, be distributing out to the industry. But in addition to that, we also have, um, we're going to buy additional gear marking supplies, including heat shrink tube and twine uh, for the non-solid marks. And we will be um, just setting up a series of distribution events, much like we did last year with a week rope. Uh, we are, an advisory is going to go out, go out to that effect probably early next week to let fishermen know that that's going to be available. And along with that, uh, we'll have several um, examples made up of compliant gear that fishermen can use as a reference at each of those events. Thanks, Bob. So a question to Bob, Bob you're gonna be inclusive of the conch fishermen and the pot fishermen in these seminars. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair, absolutely. Um, we are including, um, so in the first round, we we also were um, we went, made events out to the to Martha's Mark, Vineyard was one of the areas we went and we had a pretty good turnout among conch fishermen. But in, yes, in general, relative to the the advisory going out, we're in, going to be informing all trap pot fishermen, whether that's lobster pot, uh, fish pot, and or conch pot, and we will we will be having those events scheduled throughout the state probably in in late February, early March. Um, and we'll have free gear to distribute at those times. And we'll we'll have several examples and be there to, to answer any question that, that, that uh, fishermen may have. Thank you, Bob. Dan or Bob, who's gonna, who wants to continue this presentation? Well, I think at this point where we have a recommended uh, motion, and I think if there's no other questions, we. The commission can make a motion to accept or to, um, or to. Okay, or well, let me, uh, let me open this up to discussion. Any discussion or questions about the recommended motion? Jared, any hands? I'm not seeing any further comments, Mr. Chair. Thank you. I would like a motion. Motion to approve as presented. Thank you, Bill. We need a second. Second and Shelly. Thank you, Shelly. Is there any opposition? If there is, raise your uh, hand. Mr. Chair, this needs to be a roll call vote. Okay. Let me break out my... All right. Roll call vote. Yay or nay? Recommended motion. EMF is recommending the MFAC vote to, uh, do I need to read this entire motion? No, we yeah. can take the motion as recommended on the screen um, and made the motion by Bill Doyle, second by Shelly Edmondson and bring it Thank to you. a roll call vote and just and just call the roll. Thank you. Michael Pierre, not. Yes. Dukey Sawyer. Yes. Tim Brady. Yes. Lou Williams. Yes. Shelly Edmondson. Yes. Bill Amaru. Yes. Malia Bogdan. Yes. And Bill Doyle. Yes. Thank you all. Everybody was in favor. Motion approved. Motion passes unanimously. Okay. Ray, the next issue is the gill net closure, closure to, to protect, protect right of yeah. So um, I can start with this, and if, if Bob wants to weigh in toward the end, that's that's fine. Um, the 
the Gilnet uh, closure dates back to uh, the, our first uh, regulations of the large real take reduction plan back in 1997. And at the time it was just in the, what's called the, the critical habitat or the state waters portion of the critical habitat, which you can see on the screen, the uh, area with the, 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 uh, uh, the diagonal hash marks. Uh, we amended it uh, slightly over time. Uh, first, we went to that little uh, light blue area south of Plymouth. Uh, and then in 2021, we made a, uh, a, another change to, uh, to more or less try to match it up with the area of the speed limit because we knew there were, or we suspected, and we were seeing right whales there seasonally. And then, um, frankly, when, when we enacted all the rules last year uh, through this commission, and uh, we, we extended the closure to the lobster fishery all the way to the New Hampshire border. Uh, you know, there were, there were many who questioned, uh, well, if the, if the lobster fishery can't have vertical buoy lines, uh, how much sense does it make to allow the gillnetters to have buoy lines at some location? Um, at the time, uh, we, we weren't addressing the, the gillnet fishery because the gillnet fishery, as I mentioned earlier, was kind of phase two of the large whale take reduction plan that is still ongoing. So uh, we did not, uh, we weren't prepared to uh, make that change. Although when, when requested, I'm sorry, when it was before me to extend the ground fish fishery into the month of April, I balked at allowing the gill netters in there uh, because of the, the, uh, the, the potential for entanglement. So we thought about it over the, over the um, summer uh, examining what are, what the mandates are on us for this uh, incidental take permit, and given the uh, the fairly uh, low level of, um, of, of gillnet activity, uh, we are proposing to uh, take a look at at, at uh, proposing to close the area uh, consistent with that of the lobster fishery uh, all the way up to the New Hampshire border during that similar time period. Um, so, uh, you know, this, this proposal does have, uh, you know, uh, some conservation benefits, uh, theoretically, especially regarding um, codfish in, in the Massachusetts Bay Area. Um, and it is also uh, consistent with a, um, another proposal that we're gonna make later, where we want to um, do away with that sort of conditional opening uh, each year that happens in the month of April, where the uh, under the regulation, the director is, is allowed to decide based on an accounting of brownfish uh, species landed against the federal set aside whether or not to keep uh, the, the, the groundfish fishery fishing uh, you know, during the month of April. So we have some changes there as well. So, um, so we do have uh, the, the recommended motion uh, that, that is on the board um, to uh, expand the gill net closure all the way to New Hampshire. It does reduce entanglements uh, risk in April and May, particularly in Mass Bay. And it also uh, you know, uh, is part of our strategy for the, the large whale, uh, I'm sorry, the incidental take permit. And when I say strategy, uh, you know, Bob and his team have been diligently uh, working on uh, documentation to the National Marine Fisheries Service about the, the incidental take permit and the scope of, of what the permit should entail. And in a recent uh, uh, correspondence, uh, we have sent a report to them uh, describing the gillnet fishery, which is substantially smaller than it ever has been. Uh, and we're recommending it not be considered as part of the incidental take permit because we don't, we believe that, uh, especially with this uh, proposed closure, if enacted, that the potential uh, risk of entanglement is, uh, is minuscule. And uh, it, I guess the incidental take permit uh, is a permit for a fishery when you expect to take one. Uh, obviously the lobster fishery having uh, entangled uh, a right whale twice in 13 years, you know, one could argue whether there's a reasonable expectation that will happen again. Um, if it does with all the weak rope, we expect uh, you know, far less uh, uh, threat of injury. Uh, and of course, in the case of leatherback turtles being entangled in the up and down lines, uh, you know, on a more regular basis with a couple of mortalities a year, uh, we are including those fisheries that, that do have a history of, of those takes. 
as far as the gillnet fishery goes, uh, we don't see that kind of a risk, uh, especially if we can eliminate the risk uh, when right whales are present, which is the, the peak months of uh, March, April to early May. So, hey, can I, oh, go ahead, sorry. Jerry. Oh, I was just, just gonna add one small point of clarification. Um, you, you would say that the closure is gonna go out to the New Hampshire border and, and, and that takes into account that most of the gill netting that occurs in Massachusetts is, is north of the current closure boundary, but the recommended closure is to actually apply this to all state waters. And, and the thinking there is that east of Cape, closing east of Cape Cod, while there is currently no gill net activity there, Historically, there has been some, and we do have um, observed presence of right whales, particularly in April and May, east of Cape Cod, and to also close south of Cape Cod, so the closure be throughout all state waters. There's no gillnet fishing south of Cape Cod. We also don't have a, a, a tremendous amount of right whale observations in that area, but we are including that just to make a, a more simple rule. Got it. Thanks for that. Thank you, Jared. So am I going to open this to discussion now? I, I think that's appropriate, Ray. Thank you, Director. Discussion? Lou? Anything? Yeah, thanks, Ray. Um, yeah, I mean, I just, as far as uh, the proposal, um, um, I'll, of course, be in fa favor of it. You know, last thing we need is a right whale in the uh, end lines. Just get, we've gone to that point. We have to... Uh, Look at it that way, but my concern is um, when we start chopping things up and say, "Okay, we're going to put this closure in," then we go back to the old rules. So the way it's <clears throat> with nothing else done when this goes into effect, uh, say it's May fifteenth, the boats the they want to go uh, start to set. All they've got is a really lousy piece of bottom down off of Cohasset that will be open to them until June first, and I think where they've taken a with this this um, closure will take away the f first two weeks of May down there, where it's the only time to really catch a few fish there, and then it kind of tapers out because I've fished there that month. And um, I'd like to see when uh, it opens up May fifteenth that it opens up <clears throat> up to the forty two thirty again instead of waiting to June. Give the boats back those two weeks just north of there um, instead of making them go, you know I, I go go in there. You know it's just I like to see a little balance, you know, you're taking away, let's give a little bit back, you know? So um, that's, that's what my recommendation would be. I'm fine with the closure, but when it does open May 15th, where you've taken two, the first two weeks of May away from them and they lost April, um, let's at least just make it open in an area where there might be a few fish uh, instead of making them go down to an area where I know that it just plays out there. So uh, I hope that the commission would consider that uh, to be part of this recommendation. Dan, Thanks. Thank you, Lou. Dan, response? Um, that's a good question. Um, I don't know if, if that was part of the public hearing agenda. Um, so I'm trying to think, think this through in terms of the sequencing. Um, I don't know if we post postpone this vote to to try to look at that or but or but maybe go through with the with the closure i think the closure itself would stay intact the question is the opening so so i guess i'll turn to jared are we are we able to still do the closure and um but but is is lou really asking for an amendment to the next item we Which have, is the at, at this measures? point, we took no public comment on on adjusting the the timing or area of the May um, <clears throat> um, groundfish closure, which runs, I believe, from Boston to the New Hampshire border. Um, so procedurally, we cannot take any action on that. That, that that's not something that's that, that's open for a recommendation at that point. That would have to be a um, additional. Um, that, that would have to go out to public hearing and come back at a at a uh, separate commission meeting. So it would have to be handled separately from that. And previously, when we have analyzed moving that up either to the 4225 or the 4230, uh, we have decided not to do that due to concerns about that being 
uh, the peak period for spawning cod in state waters and there being known spawning cod aggregation in that water between Boston and uh, Marblehead. So in summary, we, we've reviewed this proposal before and haven't moved a May adjustment to that groundfish closure forward. And we, if we were to consider it again, it would have to be part of a separate rulemaking package. And that would take about six months from now to go in. So it wouldn't be for this year. Right. I mean, there's a lot of moving parts here. So, um, you know, maybe once the dust settles this spring, we, we could consider looking at that for next year because we, we need to figure out like who's, who's left, who's still using the area, et cetera. Yeah, we're also proposing as part of the next or one of the upcoming action items to increase the yellowtail trip limits and the cod trip limits to provide the remaining state waters groundfish fleet with a additional um, ability to harvest groundfish at times and places where spawning cod and right whales are, are of less concern. Lou? Uh, yeah, I just, I, I just hope the commission would look at this because this is, you know, it's, here we are now, now we've got a closure basically October 1st through May 15th um, in this fishery. Uh, yeah, we've increased, um, well, we're proposing increase some trip limits, but um, increasing trip limits and making guys fish in an area where there's no fish or very little fish, um, that doesn't help either when you've taken the two weeks away. They do catch a few yellowtails uh, down there, and then they play out the second two weeks. And you can even look in your landings, some of the boats that were fished down, they only went there one year because it was so horrible and just wasn't worth it to make. Um, but the couple of boats that do fish there, you'll see a lot of years, they, they're, they're uh, trip reports for May that by the third week, they've got the gear on the boat waiting for it to open up to the north. So I, I'm just, you know, this is just a death by a thousand cuts, and it's, you know, for, for me, it's, um, it's how this business is going. And it's, uh, I just, uh, uh, I just hope the commission will do something in this just to uh, give something back because I've just had everything taken away for 25 years and nobody gives anything back. So um, I really uh, feel this strongly about this um, uh, rather than, uh, you know, and I understand the whale issue, but you know, I just hope we can can, uh, can do it and do it for this year, not, you know, put it off. So, okay. Thank you. So, Jared, can you explain the six-month process, why this couldn't go out to a public hearing in the next two months and then come back so we could vote on this? Well, question? sure. It could, go, it could go out to public hearing in the next, if this is something We'd, we'd want staff to analyze it. We'd have to come back at the March meeting with an analysis and a, and a proposal from the director as to whether or not we would want to proceed with that. Um, then we would go out to public, we'd file the internal executive review paperwork. That's a approximate eight week process. From there, we go out to public hearing at another four weeks under the 30A uh, notification rules to that. So we're now looking at a uh, June public hearing, come back at a uh, August commission meeting, July, August commission meeting with a final recommendation. And then, you know, another four to six weeks for executive review following any approval of a recommendation. And we're looking at, you know, a September, October, September, you know, August, September, um, final regulation. So, I mean, the, it may, the only way we'd be able to, to accommodate that schedule would be to file an emergency regulation. And I, I'm uncertain as to, um, you know, if we analyze in the past, we haven't moved forward with, with such a thing due to spawning caught concerns. So, you know, I'm not sure where the emergency would be or if the director would use his emergency authority on that, I'd, I'd refer that to Dan, but I, I'd, I'd encourage the commission to consider that this, this current gillnet closure is a pressing issue um, for this season, um, given our incidental take permit application 
and 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 the concerns of right well so I, I i would encourage them not to not to tether the two items together um and if they want us to review um this for a um potential change in the future that we could do so and come back with an analysis at an upcoming commission meeting or, or have the ground fish subcommittee um review it and then come back to the commission with a, a better understanding of, of the the issues in play Thank you, Jared. So, Lou, uh, I'm sure you're not happy with what you were just told. This the process. Yeah. Is yeah, right. Um, you know, I, I listened to the other night, I listened to the uh, uh, the public hearing on the um, um, putting the uh, ropeless traps in. And, and I, I don't know. I, you know, there's always, you can always get something done if you want to get it done. And I see that they were looking at, uh, and it's not up to commission, it's up to Dan. Uh, a letter of authorization um, to do that fishery. You're going to have maybe two or three boats fishing. This is all it's going to affect. And I'm, I'm not speaking for myself because I'm not, I'm, I'm done with it, as I've told you guys before. But I just think this is wrong to just keep jamming this stuff down guys' throats. And I think if uh, Dan could write a letter of authorization so the two or three boats that are fishing to be able to fish in that area, I think that would be a real simple fix to that for this season. But again, it depends. Uh, on the feeling of uh, dragging this stuff out or what. I just think it can be done. I just, if it isn't done, I just really think it's because people don't want to do it. So <clears throat> I think it's the right thing to do. Uh, I would hope that you could come up with a solution. So uh, we'll, we'll see what happens. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Lou. Dan, any comeback? Well, I, yeah, I don't want to get into a, a, a debate with Lou. I, I understand your point, Lou. Our, our attempt at trying to uh, salvage some of these businesses was to increase the trip limits and if we haven't succeeded in, in mitigating the impacts of that. I'm not totally adverse to, to um, amending uh, the rules in the future, but I, I, I think it's important for me to comment um, on this so-called letter of authorization. I, I do have concerns that the, the authority that people um, think that the director has or should have to issue letters that, that anytime there's a regulation that doesn't fit somebody's business plan is problematic. And, you know, I'll, 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 I'll um, I guess I'll forecast or I'll, I'll give you a little foreshadowing about the hearing the other night. Um, I have uh, a lot of discomfort about a request for that particular letter of authorization because, um, you know, I'm trying to align myself uh, or my program here with that of the National Marine Fisheries Service as we sort of co-manage these fisheries. Uh, and they have uh, some real goals about research in that particular fishery and, and, uh, and gear trials and gear development. And so I wouldn't su suggest that, um, that issuing a letter of authorization is, is, a, um, is going to be easy for, the, for that particular activity because uh, I don't see uh, much in the way of, uh, of uh, sort of organized research or a, a experimental design. But as far as just issuing an LOA, um, if the reg doesn't fit, I, I'm uncomfortable with that. And I'm, I struggle with it, Lou, to be, to be frank. And I am willing to have a larger conversation with the commission about this, uh, but I do want to temper expectations that, about the, you know, kind of a get out, get out of jail free card that the director can to, to hand out when the when the rules don't fit. I mean, we have had pilot programs um, you know, like like uh, like the weekly trip limits and things like that, but they're all consistent with the with the overarching goals of the management system. And uh, but I'll stop there. But it's the, this is a difficult one for a director to have that kind of authority and, and how to use it. So I, I struggle with that. So I would urge the, the commission to, uh, to approve, you know, continue the debate. I, I would urge you to approve this, um, but I'm not adverse to uh, sitting down and, and having another conversation about moving that line, especially if we find that the implications of this season are that uh, what we're doing is, is the, the 999th cut of, you know, of the thousand. And if it's going to uh, really damage the, the, um, the the economic viability of those businesses. Um, I'd like to know that. 
and I'd like Thank to you. prevent that. Thank you, Director. Are you comfortable with that, Lou? Yeah, yeah, that's fine, Ray. You know, I, I understand, you know, but, you know, I understand Dan's position. I just hope he understands my position looking at this, too, and I think he does. So, appreciate it, Dan. Thanks, Lou. Thank you, Lou. Any more discussion on this recommendation? Bill Amaru. Bill, you're recognized. Bill, you're muted. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I apologize. Um, yeah, I don't want to expand the discussion much further than this. I think everybody understands the importance of what, what Dan's trying to accomplish here, how important the fishery is, that uh, we, have to, we have to stand by the division when we talk about this issue. But what I, what I hear Lou saying and what I want to, exact, to also underline and underscore is that when we have an opportunity down the road to try and do something to liberalize a fishery, we have to take it by the horns and do good work to make it possible for an expansion where we've been cutting back at every level for so long on these fisheries. And I think that's what he's asking. That's what I would ask. Not that we under uh, cut the, the efforts on the part of the division to get this permit in place, but that we, we completely rationalize the fact that we have to do something down the road to allow these fisheries to continue or we won't be managing these fisheries in the future. And uh, that's, that's my feeling. I support the motion, I'll vote in favor for it, but I want the division to uh, be earnest with, with the, with the uh, suggestions that Lou made and that I think we're all responsible to uh, endorse. Thank you. Thank you, Bill. Any other discussion? I'm not seeing any additional hand raised, Mr. Chair. Okay. This will be a roll call vote. We need a motion. We have a recommended motion on the board, so we'd be looking for Mr. Member to make a right. motion to adopt that. Right. Is anybody going to make the motion? I'll move the motion, Bill Amaru. Bill, thank you. I need a second. I'll second that. That's Bill that Doyle. Better? Bill Doyle, thank you. All right, Michael Piernock. Yes. Suki Sawyer. Yes. Tim Brady. Yes. Lou Williams. Yes. Kelly Edmondson. Yes. Bill Amaru. Yes. Khalil Bogdan. Yes. Bill Doyle. Yes. Unanimously approved. Moving on. Uh, commercial so ground. Hey, go ahead, Lou. Sorry, Ray. Commercial, yeah, commercial ground fish trip limits and spatial temporal closures is going to be handled by Jared. Thank you, Jared. You're recognized. Okay, so there's there's going to be a couple uh, recommended motions in this. Um, action so um i'm going to go through them all um and the, the 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 several items that we're going to deal with here um and you know based on the last i i have these parsed out currently to be voted on individually um as single motions but i think you based on the last conversation on gillnets and, and lose comments that perhaps we want to consider them as a as a package because um, several of them are contingent on the adoption of the spawning closure. So um, we can amend the way this is going to be recommended and I'll, I'll work through that as I go through the slides. So uh, the first issue we're going to be dealing with is a, is a new um, proposed spawning closure for Gulf of Maine Cod. Um, you know, DMF has a history of implementing spawning closures to protect groundfish. We have a winter flounder spawning closure throughout lots of the inshore waters of, of the state waters portion of the Gulf of Maine um, from May 1 to Feb, uh, from February 1 to May 31, which was adopted in uh, the late 80s and early 90s. Uh, then later on, um, we, have, we adopted the cod conservation zones, which are 
discrete seasonal closures around cod spawning periods um, based on some of our acoustic tagging work. Um, there's also the, gill, uh, the, the, the groundfish mortality closures in May and June and uh, October through January, which are designed as mortality closures, but also provide spawning protections as they close the commercial groundfish fishery. Um, in areas of Mass Bay where uh, spawning cod aggregations are during those periods. Um, more recently, the federal government and this Omnibus Habitat Amendment 2 adopted a new Mass Bay spawning protection area, uh, which goes between, uh, excuse me, 4230 and, and 42, so Plymouth and Marblehead. Um, and then west of 7030 to 71 um, during the second half of April, April 15 to April 30. Uh, we did not immediately move to match this spawning closure as we have other uh, federal closures in the past. Uh, this was largely informed by some of uh, our prior thinking on cod spawning timing. And, and as IBS one shows, you know, May was the big month for the spring spawning cohort. Um, and, and we were um, less, uh, there, there was less impetus on, on April being a month to protect for, for, for spawning cod. Um, but as IBS 2 wrapped up, uh, we, we became more interested in, in April as a month for spawning cod. As, as you can see during IBS 2, April is now nearly as important as May. Uh, at, but you know, while and we've also seen a shrinkage of the uh, amount of or the observations of spring spawning cod, so so that spawning cohort has shrunk, and, and we're now more reliant on um, the winter co the winter spawning cohort to provide um, to 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 provide uh, spawn for the population. Um, and, and we've observed that the importance of these two cohorts of changed over time, but one of our concerns moving forward, considering this, the status of the Gulf of Maine cod stock is to ensure that both populations continue to persist um, as a means of helping this stock recover. Um, so, you know, there, there is an importance in, in, in protecting that, that spring spawning cohort. So with that in mind, the first recommendation is to adopt an April 15th or April 30th spawning cod closure. We had initially, um, uh, you know, to, to, to do that, not just within the area that falls under the federal closure, which is um, uh, 42 to 4230, but to extend that all the way up to the Mass New Hampshire border, as there are, as IBS-1 had observed um, spawning, Caught aggregations up north on on the uh, up north around Cape Ann, and, and with the idea of protecting those spotted cod aggregations, should they should the population begin to rebuild, that would provide some protection to those known aggregations. Um, at this time, there's not much um, April trawling that occurs up up north of Cape Ann. That's primarily sea skull dredge fishing, and sea skull dredge would be exempt from that. So that's the first aspect of the proposal, of the recommended proposal. And um, the, 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 the second aspect then is, is to, to provide it that that April closure, um, that April spawning closure is adopted. Um, you know, we're looking at that April conditional closure as um, somewhat redundant. Um, given the spawning, the potential for a spawning closure to be adopted during the second half of April and the right whale closure that was just approved to gill nets, as gill nets are a primary gear type uh, to target groundfish during the spring. Um, so, brief history on the groundfish mortality closures. Um, you know, these were adopted in the late 90s to match federal rolling closures. Um, they were designed principally to control mortality and landings, but given their seasonality, they also provide broad scale spawning protection. We most recently amended the, the, the timing and, and, and areas affected um, in 2016 um, 
and then in 2019 we adopted the April conditional uh, closure between Plymouth and Marblehead west of 7030 and that was uh, designed to be a fail safe to prevent the GE fishery from cover causing overages of the annual catch limit set by NOAA thereby triggering accountability measures for federal permit holders. Um, the closure has been lifted each of the three years since its implementation. So basically DMS statistics program during the during the winter period tallies the, the state waters landings for the uh, current federal fishing year, May 1 to April 30th. Um, then we compare those landings to the state water subcomponents or set asides for each stock. And, and we kind of make a judgment based on that and prior performance as, if, as to whether a opening April will result in us not only exceeding the set asides for state waters, but that exceedance also potentially causing a, a exceedance of the federal ACLs and a triggering of accountability measures for the federal permit holder. Uh, so each of the past three years, we've determined that a closure isn't necessary to do that. So we've lifted the April conditional closure. Uh, now with the potential for that April 15th to April 30th, um, COD spawning closure and the implementation of a new gill net closure to protect right whales, this April conditional closure becomes largely redundant. Um, so there's less of a, with these additional overarching closures, there's less of a need to have this as a fail safe. Um, as a, and so we'd be looking to rescind that, which would allow some amount of ground fish fishing, likely a small nominal amount given the, the, the presence of ground fish in state waters during the first half of April before that larger um, spawning closure goes into effect. Um, and then, you know, in consideration of the fact that we are expanding closures, um, we, we wanted to provide additional opportunities to target um, available ground fish stocks at times and places where spawning cod and uh, right whales are less of a concern, uh, which would be, you know, those, those um, late spring, early summer, late spring months, summer months into the early fall. Um, so we examined the various trip limits for the um, ground fish, the multi-species ground fish complex for state waters and the two stocks that we um, felt comfortable or, or had the ability to adjust the trip limits for our uh, Gulf of Maine cod and Gulf of Maine yellowtail flounder. Uh, other commercially important stocks include um, haddock, which there is no trip limit for, uh, winter flounder, which we are bound by the interstate management plan to not exceed the 500 pound trip limit, which is where we're currently at for state waters, and gray sole, which is not commonly caught in state waters. And in fact, we reduced the trip limit from 1,000 to 750 several years ago uh, in an attempt to constrain um, what we thought was some illegal fishing going on in the federal zone. We had uh, some good reports that there was some illegal fishing going on in the deeper waters of the federal zone to target uh, gray sole at those elevated levels. Um, so we, we didn't want to raise the gray sole limit back up so as to encourage that illegal fishing activity again. Um, so our focus was, in t uh, was principally on Gulf of Maine cod and Gulf of Maine yellowtail flounder. Um, the cod trip limit we had initially proposed to go up to 300. We got a comment at the public hearing to raise that on up to 400. We went back and analyzed the data a little bit more, looked at it again, and we're comfortable given attrition in the state waters ground fish fishery, the implementation of these uh, of the gill net closure and the spawning cod closure that we could go up to 400 pounds and stay within the state water subcomponent for Gulf of Maine cod. Um, for yellowtail flounder, we proposed to go up from 250 to 350. Um, there was a request to go up at public hearing to go up higher than 350 to four, four to 500 pounds. Uh, we did not feel as comfortable doing that given um, where the state waters catch of yellowtail flounder is compared to the set aside. 
and given some um, that the, the timing of yellowtail flounder spawning. Um, so we're recommending that we keep that proposed increase from 250 to 350 pounds for yellowtail and not go any higher than that. So in summary, the, the, the recommended motions are to adopt an April 15 through April 30 spawning closure and then contingent on the adoption of that to rescind the April conditional closure um, and to increase the trip limits for Gulf of Maine cod from 200 pounds to 400 pounds and Gulf of Maine yellowtail flounder from 250 to 350 pounds. So, Mr. Chair, we can take comments on comments and questions on this. And in terms of moving a motion forward, the best way would probably be to move the motion. Um, this recommended motion forward first. Um, should this pass, then we could um, discuss the uh, discuss the other two recommended motions. Or, or should it not pass? Uh, you know give the ball back to Dan to see how he wants to, to move the other items forward. Okay, thank you. So discussion on the recommended motion on the board. We can have broader discussion about all three motions. It doesn't have to just be on this. I just like to move this recommendation first and then deal with the other two recommendations subsequent. Okay, so then you're open to having discussion on all three recommendations. Yeah, I think that's best because they're 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 intertwined, right. uh, and I wouldn't want to limit the discussion to just this since the other okay. items are are you know proximate to it. All right, commission members, you've heard Jared's discussion, um, and I'm going to open it up to the commission members for discussion. Lou. Lou Williams, you're recognized. Yeah. Um, well, here we go again. So now we're going to close the whole month of April. It doesn't matter to the Gill Matters, obviously, now with the right whale issue. But now we've the mobile gear boats, two or three of them. And um, <clears throat> instead of just doing the two weeks, we are going to do the whole month. No, it would know. just be the two. It would just be the two okay. weeks. Okay, so we do the two weeks, and those are the that's for the fish, a few fl flounders because those guys don't catch any codfish. Uh, stop moving in. Um, this was brought on because of guys I know what was going on the last few years. Some of the lost the federal boats were pissed off that the state boats fishing in the half hour were able to fish there and they couldn't. But if you look at the chart, those boats that were complaining, they just instead of fishing on the state line, they just had to get over that closure line by the Northwest corner, you know, maybe another half hour steam and then set out and keep fishing. This two week closure, the few boats we have left, that just ties them to the dock. They have no place to go, okay? So they got no place to go then. So then May, the way it's structured now at 4220, those mobile gear boats have no place to go again. So. This ties those boats up till June now. So in the first two weeks of April there, it's all just skates. And the fish just don't show up, start showing up till the middle of April. Again, I'm not going to support this. I'm just, you know, it's just enough's enough, you know. And in this closure, I believe, was a sector closure. So here we are. We're regulating with sector rules, common pool rules. Um, I mean, it's just, it just, to me, it just gets to the point of complete ridiculous. And then, we talk about how we have we have to save these cod that um, uh, managers uh, back in during catch she has destroyed it, which we all know. But again, the uh, onus comes on the small boats inshore that have to rebuild the stock of fish that were wiped out in 2010 under catch she is. So here we are again. So I'm, I'm not going to support this because it just ties more boats to the dock, the handful of boats to the left. Uh, the little bit they catch, um, it doesn't amount to anything in the whole, the whole scheme of things. And this is, this to me, I know the whole history behind it. It's just a few guys crying about it. They couldn't fish right off the state waters. They had to, God forbid, they had, had to steam another half hour and get to the Northwest corner. So no, I'm not, I'm not in favor of this. This is again, a more, <laughs> more cuts, more, more of those thousand cuts. So that's all I have to say about it. Thank you. 
Thank you, Lou. Any other hands, Gary? I'm not seeing any other hands. Oh, Bill Amber. Bill, you recognize. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I have a question. Does this mean that a hand liner targeting Haddock off of Brant Rock can't fish during these two weeks? Yes. Can I ask what all gear is capable of catching ground yeah. fish, excluding shellfish dredges such as sea spawn? Yeah, yeah I, I, I mean, I, I'm being redundant. I, I, I fished out there the last three or four years on that haddock stock that's in that area, and I never caught a codfish the whole time, but it caught a lot of haddock. Uh, I don't know. I, I, I'm certainly in <clears throat> sympathetic Lou. I, I feel exactly the same way. I don't know that I can't support this because. Again, I uh, <clears throat> pulled both ways. I know the importance of trying to protect the cod, but I don't know how much protection you're going to get out of this. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Bill. Jared, any other hands? I'm not seeing any other hands. So you want to move forward on this motion alone? Or are we going to look at all three motions and vote on all three motions? Well, the, the, the following two motions are contingent. The, the way the recommendation is set forth in the memorandum is that the following two motions are contingent upon the adoption of this one. Um, okay. So if, if this one passes, we can move to the other two okay. uh, measures. If not, um, you know, the ball would then go back to Dan to see uh, how he would want to move forward if with an amended recommendation or, and address the other two components of this should it fail. Fine. So ladies and gentlemen on the board, uh, I'm gonna ask for a motion here on the recommended motion, which is on the board. Hello? Mike, Mike Pernock, motion to approve. I need a second. Shelly Edmondson, second. Thank you, Michael. Thank you, Shelly. And this will be a roll call vote, Jared. <laughs> Correct. Michael Pernock. Yes. Suki Sawyer. Yes. Jim Brady. Yes. Lou Williams. No. Jelly Edmondson. Yes. Bill Amaru. Uh, no. Leo Bogdan. Yes. And Bill Doyle. No. Motion passes five to three. Five in favor, three opposed. So I presume you can move on now, Jared, to your second and third motion. Yeah, I, I think it would be simplest. And while I don't, unfortunately, don't have a slide that does this, but I think it would be simplest to combine the next two uh, motions into one singular motion, which would be to rescind the April conditional closure and then to increase the Gulf of Maine COD. Uh, trip limits from 200 to 400 and yellowtail flounder trip limits from uh, 250 to 350. Um, so if you want to take a motion on, uh, seek a motion on those, on the combined recommendation. Uh, by all means, can you put it on the board? Uh, give me one second, I'll adjust the slide, yeah. Thank you. So that would be the uh, current recommended motion, the combined recommended motion. Discussion on the motion.
No, I'm saying it. Lou? Lou Williams, yeah. you recognize. Yeah, thanks, Ray. Um, so on this motion, we're now we're going to up the trip limits and we're going to take away all of April, the first two weeks too. Is that, that's how, is it, I'm reading this right, Jared? No, we're getting rid of that April closure entirely, so it won't exist. Oh, okay. All right. Very good. Thank you. Mike Piernock. Michael, you recognize. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, just a point of clarification, uh, when these vessels are out on the water, when they achieve the 400 pounds, uh, if they catch more cod, what takes place? And is it recorded? It's discarded. Um, and the only, the, the, the catch reports only require the reporting of uh, uh, retained fish. So it, it's discarded, but the discards are, are factored into the stock assessment through the federal observer coverage. So the, there, it is ultimately, there's an assumption then for what is discarded uh, is there an assumption or, or I think you just said it, that it's based on the observer. There's a certain amount then assumed for the entire fleet of what is discarded. Melanie or Mike, feel free to jump in and correct me if I'm wrong on that. But um, that, that's my understanding. Um, based on our, um, our analysis of state waters ground fish landings, um, you know, as Lou correctly pointed out a while back, you know, the trawlers don't catch much cod. I don't think, I think, you know, only 25% of their trips are, are getting, you know, more than 150 pounds. And uh, so it's primarily, you know, um, the gillnet fleet that's catching cod and, you know, they're going to set the, their nets based on the trip limits. And I mean, the current trip limits about is 200 pounds. And, you know, most of their trips are coming in about 150 to 200 pounds. We don't have much observer coverage on this fleet, so we don't have great data on what's being discarded. Um, but, you know, so the data applied would be the data coming from the federal observer coverage, and, and that would be factored into the uh, stock assessment. And just one last question based upon uh, that information. Uh, there is, has, has the, the quota been exceeded, the state quota for COD? including the discards where we've been under or over and, and if if we've been under or over how long has that taken place recently the past few years or has it been constant the 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 discard rates are, are viewed against the the sub acl when we look at the um conditional closure in april in the past we have exceeded the um the sub components for gulf of maine cod but we've exceeded them at a nom a level nominal enough where it doesn't um but up against the overall ACL for the fishery. Um, so, and again, because it's not a hard quota and it's these soft sub, sub components, we don't close the fishery when we, um, when we reach um, the sub component, it stays open. And, and we try to aim to, through closures and trip limits and, and, and prior performance, you know, analysis of prior performance manage this fishery in a way where it doesn't exceed the sub ACLs. And if it does, that exceedance is nominal enough that it doesn't um, exceed the overall, it doesn't result in an exceedance of the overall ACLs, which would include catch from the federal um, fisheries. I thought that was my last question, but just one more quick question. So what did they exceed in, um... 2021, 2020, or 2019? 2021 is still ongoing. Um, so um, we don't have an analysis of that yet because that fishing year will go through the end of April. Um, and I believe Anna's on here today. So maybe Anna can help me out with the, with the other two years, but I don't believe we exceeded the, the sub components in 2019 or 2020. Is that correct? Microphone is trying to fit in. Hold on. Yeah, I have it right here. Yeah, go ahead, Melanie. Yeah, so for 2020, if they're talking about. Melanie, we can't hear you. Sorry, I'm here with Mike. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Yes. Okay. So for 2020, the Gulf of Maine caused 31% utilization, and for 2019, it was a 61% utilization. 
basically ever since, as Jared said, ever since we put in the conditional closure, we actually haven't had the problem that triggered the, the um, putting in the conditional closure. So we've never had to actually use it. And, and Mike, I'd add that, you know, part of the, the story here is that there is attrition um, in this state waters ground fish fleet. And when you're dealing with a fishery of 10, you know, losing two fishermen to retirement uh, makes it a fishery of eight, but it's a 20% loss of effort. So, you know, as this gets whittled, as the fishery shrinks, we, we you know, every, every retirement is a, um, is a substantial loss in, in, in effort. So we're not terribly surprised that over the past three years, we haven't hit the sub ACL for this, where we might have in the few years prior to that. And, you know, that's because we've, we've seen a couple of the historic participants in this fishery either pass on or, or retire out. Thank you, Jared. Thank you, Jared. Thank you, Anna. I have no more questions. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. Any other questions on this? Recommendation. Yep. Bill Amaro. Bill, you're recognized. Bill, you're muted. Okay, now I think you might be able to hear me. Yeah, I can't remember, sorry. unfortunately, after the discussion, it was just held at what the question was or the addition I was going to make. But I do did want to mention one thing. The recent federal announcement for uh, the Georgia's cod stock was a, of a, a cut of an unbelievable percentage. I think it was between 70 and 90 percent cut. And if it isn't obvious by what's going on with the reduction in commercial fishing effort overall, the decline in, in the numbers of pounds that have been taking, and yet these drastic reductions that are required in the commercial fishing industry, we're obviously not addressing the fundamental problem of what's going on. Uh, and I don't know that there's any way that we can. I'm not saying that we're, we're avoiding our need to do something in addition. And I remember now what I was going to say. And that's that. Uh, of course, it's left me again. Uh, forgive me. I'll come back to it later if, the, if it's still on the floor. Thank you, Bill. And Lou. Yeah, I just this is just to address to uh, to Mike uh, his concern about discards, and I I want to correct you, Jared. It's they're not we don't haul gear in the gill net industry. We've gotten very good at setting the gear we need depending on the trip limits. And to give you an example, all those years of two hundred, I never threw any fish overboard. Uh, we're hauling along. We get a, if we get to a point we have a two hundred, we'll either tie off and set the gear back, and the next day haul the gear from the other end. Uh, if we think we need to, we'll leave the gear on the boat. If we figure we'll get it out of the gear, it's left in the water on a two night set. So I just want to correct that assumption that, um, at least in the Gilnet fleet, uh, we don't, the discarding is, is minimal because we can, we're, we've come up with our own way of handling it. So we don't discard it because we, we don't want to discard it. We want to land it. and the times of year that we can catch the cod are on their way out. So you have to maximize what you can get. So I just wanted to correct that assumption. Thank you. Yeah. Lou, I, I want to clarify that. I, I was more trying to say that we don't have data to, to describe. We don't have good data to describe the discards, but based on the landing data we have, it appears that you know the, the Giona fleet is coming in with at or less than the um, the trip limit, which would indicate that there is you know not a tremendous amount of discard. Yeah. Okay. Thanks, Jared. Yeah. Uh, Bill Amber, I see the thoughts come back to you. Yes, thank you. Third time's the charm. So what I wanted to tell you was under the electronic uh, reporting system, the federal government now requires of all of us in the ground fish fishery, there is a field that needs to be filled out that describes the discarded fish that you put back in the water. And I know that that may not be terribly relevant information. They, they, they do, I believe, put much more emphasis on observed data coverage than they do on reported uh, data coverage for, for overages, but, or for discards. But it does exist and it is a requirement and it, it, it either should be used or it should be eliminated and not uh, put an additional burden on us to, to try and, and fill those fields, which may or may not be even worth adding, but that, that it is there. Thank, Thank you, Bill. Bill. More discussion on this recommendation. 
I'm not seeing any further hands raised, Mr. Chair, so we could we move this to a motion? Yes, please, let's move this to a motion. I need a motion, gentlemen, ladies and gentlemen. I'll move the question. So I'll second it. I'll second it, Lou Williams. Thank you, Bill. Thank you, Lou. Roll call vote. Michael Pierna. Hello, Michael. Jared, are you hearing him? I am not. He's muted. May have stepped away for a moment. I'd, I'd move to the next. Suki Sawyer. Yes. Tim Brady. Yes. Lou Williams. Yes. Shelly Edmondson. Yes. Bill Amaru. Yes. Leo Bogdan. Yes. Bill Doyle. Yes. Michael Pierna. Michael Pierna. I think the fish guides were stopping me, but yes. <laughs> Thank you. Unanimous, all in favor. Okay, moving along here. I don't uh, maybe we should take a biological break here. Let's take a 10 minute break before we move on here. What time will we return, Ray? I'm looking uh, at my phone right now. That is 9.50. 9.50, 9.50. I'm going to pause the recording now. The meeting is uh, out of session until 9.50. We are reconvening the uh, January meeting. Moving on with action items. Recommendation on the small mesh squid trawl season adjustment. Okay, Ray, I can take that. Yeah, and go for it. Welcome back, Commission. Um, so today we have a proposal before you that seeks to uh, amend the end date, but at the same time eliminating the authority of the director or the, not the authority, but the discretion built into the regulation for the for the director to extend the fishery um, beyond that June 9th period. Um, in some ways, uh, I, I've, I've kind of arrived at what I think is a, a reasonable um, compromise between what I think are the various forces that uh, pull and push on this particular fishery. Um, and uh, I'll see if I can sell you on that. So the small mesh trawl fishery is an, a historic one. It goes back to a oh, well into the uh, middle of the 20th century uh, trawlers fishing in Nantucket Sound, even back when, um, when Nantucket Sound wasn't part of state waters, even before the, uh, the 80s. There are many areas that are fished, uh, but there's also many areas that are unfished. For example, Buzzards Bay is close to mobile key, uh, to actually to netting, and that was enacted by the legislature back in, in the late 1800s. So that area has never been uh, open to, um, to any kind of uh, trawlers. Uh, th there's also a three mile closure from uh, Mashpee around to, to uh, Chatham or points north uh, around the Cape. And then there's a, uh, those are the, the two that really do affect the squid fishery. So the squid arrive in the spring uh, when water temperatures begin to reach 50 degrees, which is typically the last days of April uh, and, and into early May. And the fishery is highly affected by weather. Uh, if you get a three day easterly uh, in the spring, uh, literally the boats can't fish or if they can fish, they can't find squid. And then when the, when the more uh, seasonal uh, Southwest winds sort of uh, come back into play, the squid show up. So there's obviously uh, a squid moving in from offshore, uh, you know, coming up through Vineyard Sound, Muskegon Channel, uh, et cetera. And, um, and it's an economically important fishery for, for some boats. So the history of um, our, our fishery uh, goes for management, uh, you know, the aggressive management, it really spans my career working in the Boston office 
Um, I recall when I first started up in Boston, there was a lot of controversy about that small mesh trawl fishery. They must be catching everything. They were a problem. And, you know, Coates and Pierce allowed me to do a lot of sea sampling uh, in that fishery uh, from, you know, based out of Boston, but I, I did a lot of field work and did a lot of sea sampling. Uh, David and I wrote a, an analysis of the, of the squid uh, fishery uh, back in the mid nineties. Uh, that report uh, doesn't even come close to the work that Brad, Sean, the Myron, Bill Hoffman did uh, last couple of years. Uh, when they had access to uh, reams of, of data, it spent considerably more time uh, than, than David and I spent. But that was our report was the precursor to that which Hoffman and Chandelmeyer performed. So the, the current regulations uh, allow the fishery to go uh, through uh, June 9th uh, with a provision to allow the director to extend it. And that whole idea of an extension was, was based on um, a notion that, that I had had back in the day, which was you could kind of uh, look at the sea sampling information and, and judge the fishery uh, as, as it's ongoing um, and as to whether or not to, to, keep, it, to keep it going. Or frankly, the, the, if the squid run turns small, uh, we, in other words, the, uh, the tubes are predominantly uh, unsailable, you know, four inches and under. Um, you know, that most boats leave. And, and in that case, sure, we should probably shut it down. Or back in the day when scup was considered overfished and overfishing was occurring, uh, the bycatch of scup, uh, which to this day is the predominant um, bycatch species of the catch, uh, you know, that was something we, we thought it would, would be worthwhile to protect. So the notion that I had back then was let's look at some sea sampling data and, and, and try to do some, some discretion and judgment to extend the fishery. If, if possible. Um, and so, you know, once upon a time, like when I first started, the squid fishery was allowed to go, I believe, after, through into early July. Um, you know, it, it slowly was scaled back. And the, the earliest end date is the one we have now, but with an expectation to, uh, to extend the fishery if warranted. And so as, as captured in the memo, uh, we've gone through a, a number of years where you know, to be responsible and to uh, be consistent with sort of the spirit of the rule as written, we've relied on, instead of state sea sampling data, although we have done some, um, we have used the federal sea sampling program and thanks to the Northeast Fishery Science Center Sea Observer Program, they've been kind enough to try to rush data out the door for us to review. And in most cases, uh, we've extended it when we've gone through that, but uh, what we've learned is it's fairly uh, challenging, uh, as, as described in the memo, to kind of forecast any, with any reliability, you know, what the future holds in the squid fishery next week based on some data that might have been collected last week. So you have up to like a three-week span between data collection, analysis, and then uh, using that data to forecast the future because the fishery uh, is highly variable from year to year the landings are highly variable to the tune of about uh, you know five uh, maybe uh, 500 percent like you might have a, a million pound year or half million pound year you might have a two and a half million pound year following so there's a lot of variability in this fishery and so the proposal that that i'm uh, that i'm requesting is that the commission consider kind of a just a minor amendment to the regulations where uh, instead of, of, of us going through a discretionary analysis and decision that we extend the fishery through the 15th, which is also the, the, um, the end date for which the, I believe the interstate and federal plans uh, also uh, uh, allow uh, scup retention in small mesh at a, at a high level. I think it's 2,000 pounds and then it drops to about 200 pounds after that date. So, you know, the federal plan has that theme built into it as well. Um, and, and I'm suggesting that, that uh, we should consider adding six days to this fishery, uh, but not extend it. And I, I believe that that's a, a, um, a reasonable compromise between, you know, those that want to uh, see, uh, you know, squid protected uh, with those that want to um, harvest squid. And it also allows fishermen to plan uh, accordingly, the notion that people would fish and then have to wait for the director of DMF to make a decision on, say, June seventh or June eighth, is um, is I, I think is is probably not the best way to 
help these businesses make firm business plans and and uh, and and also have the, the flexibility. Um, and so I would I think it's a better way to manage the fishery. We I mean it's I think it's reasonable. So the slide that's on the screen now you can see the uh, the areas. Jared, if you go forward one slide uh, is the the proposal. Actually, well, what's on the, the screen now is the is the um, is the extensions, and I'll, I'll mention those because you know the extensions have gone to you know June eighteenth, June sixteenth, um, which is nine, seven, and seven. Some years we don't extend it at all, either because we don't have any requests because the fish peters out, or um, in the case of twenty twenty, uh, that was the pandemic year. We did not. Um, you know, we see even a request for the extension, things were so screwed up that you're, I believe most of the markets were shut down because of uh, the, the inability to get product overseas. And then of course, last year, uh, as mentioned in the memo, we had a fairly late uh, easterly around uh, Memorial Day weekend and the, the squid uh, didn't really show up until uh, about a week later. And by that time, there just wasn't enough time for us to you know, to do any kind of an analysis or to, or to consider that. So I'm asking the commission, go ahead. Well, just to add to that last year, we announced on June 7th that we would close on June 9th based on the performance following that easterly. And on June 8th, the afternoon, June 8th started to get calls looking for us to reverse that decision because a, a new, um, you know, a, a new round of squid had moved into the sound and the, the boats that were fishing on the 8th, you know, were catching large tubes and it was just too short of notice to do that. Yeah. Right. Thanks, Jared. So, so who are the affected parties in this? You have, in terms of the participants in the fishery, you have uh, federal permit holders uh, who have coastal access permits, obviously, who can fish state waters. And if we don't extend the fishery, they can, uh, resume fishing, but just stay outside of three miles, most likely they're gonna be getting, going south of the islands because the center of Nantucket Sound, as we mentioned earlier, is under the state. So that fleet simply moves south of the islands. Uh, there's another fleet that doesn't have the federal permits. They tend to be smaller boats uh, and they uh, lose squid fishing opportunities if we don't extend it. And there are some years where they've had um, some really lucrative catches and uh, it's kind of made their year. And so, you know, we just got finished talking about, you know, that, you know, death by a thousand cuts, the need for, you know, the, the problems of, of, of taking away flexibility for the fleet. Um, you know, and that was one of the themes that we, that we had at one of our recent public hearings talking about, uh, or public meetings talking about the summer flounder fishery and that, you know, the, the, the commercial fishing fleet that's left uh, really needs the flexibility and, and needs to be able to re rely on the rules, allowing them to go when, when, when it's appropriate. And so in my mind, uh, it's a better way to manage this fishery uh, with, with firm beginning and end dates so guys can make firm business plans. And I would like the commission to consider uh, amending this rule and um, because I think it's it's appropriate, and I, I think, you know, as as the person who was behind the policy that kind of crafted this sort of discretionary, uh, you know, approach, you know, with real time monitoring, I'm kind of admitting it's 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 probably um, doesn't work. You know what I mean? And so, I think if you look at uh, Brad Shondelmeyer's uh, video and and his report that he and Bill Hoffman put together, I, I hope there's a certain comfort level that. Um, that you might get from the analysis of this of that fishery and all that sea sampling data. So I know this is gonna generate a lot of discussion. So why don't we begin that discussion or take some questions uh, on this proposal? I mean, I haven't touched on everything that's in the memo. The memo is fairly long and, 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 uh, and, and detailed, but I think everybody has a, has a different concern on this fishery. So why don't we begin the uh, discussion, uh, Ray, before we we uh, we take the motion, so I just want to say before we we do the motion, I'm not interested in amending this motion to say, end it at the ninth, uh, or to keep the date and do away with the discretion, because I I think uh, the squid fishery has an appropriate uh, role on the waterfront, contributes to seafood value and and participation, so 
I don't want to constrain the fishery more than it is today, uh, but I, I think I've developed a, um, a compromise uh, strategy uh, that, that I hope the commission's comfortable with. So why don't we begin the discussion with some questions, Ray? Okay, Jared. And Bill Amaru. William, you recognize. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Dan, my only question is why did you feel the need to uh, rescind the provision allowing you to extend the season? That, that takes away a little bit of, uh, of your latitude. Yeah. Um, well, there's, there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of concern among uh, other members of the public, the non-commercial fishing members of the public about forage. And, you know, and this includes the, some of the Nantucket residents uh, who, uh, you know, have, have no love for this fishery and, and uh, for a long time have even enacted a, a petition the legislature to, um, to ban mobile gear fishing in Nantucket waters. And so I am, I'm, I guess I'm trying to be Solomon here. I'm trying to, uh, you know, cut the baby in half, uh, but consistent in a way that I think the agency uh, is, is going to rely on the historical data, which is, which I think demonstrates that the fishery has a, has a bycatch uh, component, but I don't think has a bycatch problem. And um, so, and, and come June 8th of this year, um, if I can get this rule passed, uh, I won't be getting phone calls from the dealers asking that I extend it. And on June, if I, uh, and on June 14th, if we do get enacted, I won't be getting questions or requests from the dealers to extend it again with a, a commensurate number of letters and, and calls from the, the detractors. So it, Bill, it is a, it is controversial. Uh, you know, there's this, I think there's two, there's two sides to this. There's, and, um, and, I'm, and I'm trying to be sensitive to um, what some of the, the detractors of the fishery have, have argued about, you know, forage removal. And there you go. So that's, that's, that's my thinking. Dan, Dan may I add just a little, a, a little bit to that too, just to kind of reiterate your prior points about how we extend um, the fishery and, and the use of observer data to do that. And we're kind of, you know, looking at the last week of May to make decisions about the second or third week of June. And it's, you know, it, it, it's not the, the, the way to go about extending this fishery on an annual basis to, to, to use that data in that way is, is just, it, it's difficult and, as, and imperfect. So, I, you know, I think to Dan's point, you know, to not have to rely on that and instead just extend the fishery for six days um, by regulation and walk away from this annual decision to whether or not to extend it. It, it gives the fleet a little bit more flexibility and that they can fish into that second week of June, uh, but takes the decision-making away uh, from the agency be because there's not a, currently a good way to make that decision. Yeah, and Bill, I would add to what Jared just said that going back in history, um, as I mentioned, uh, the concerns were, uh, let's look at bycatch and discards. Well, that, that aspect is completely missing from the current regulations. The current regulations that I've inherited say, uh, director may extend the fishery. I, I don't even think, Jared, that there's, that there's any kind of um, criteria even suggested. Oh. There's no yeah. criteria. Yeah. So without criteria, you know, if if I'm if I'm getting if I'm getting reports that 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 the catch rates are are just uh, you know really high, um, then I'm likely to extend it, and and I probably extend it a second time, and or or you know, yeah, I don't know, give it ten days at a time or something, um, you know, and that's that's obviously going to um, you know further uh, uh, frustrate. Uh, those on on uh, in, in certain communities that don't want to see this fishery at all, and so um, I am suggesting that uh, that a June fifteenth end date, which does line up with the with the uh, interstate plans uh, allowance for scup retention, and and gives the guys you know a about a seven 
week or eight week, seven week fishery uh, before they go over to the fluke fishery. And even, uh, yeah, so, so anyway, that's my thinking is, um, is yes, discretion is great, but um, there's two sides to, you know, to every conservation or every natural resource decision. And if it's up to the commission, if you want me to keep making that, I'll keep making that decision. Okay, I guess, well, thank I you guess for you've that. hit it. I guess that's the question. If, the, if yeah. this commission would like me to continue to manage the fishery as, as normal and make decisions uh, without particular objectives, and I'm guessing it would just be based on the, the, the catch rates and the viability of, of squid, um, of, of the squid landings, then I'm willing to do that. Well, I, I, I guess my point is, and you've done a good job of explaining, uh, is that I don't like the idea of you being held hostage by any sector or any section of, of a fishery. And it sounds to me in a way that that's what you've just said. And uh, I just think that the division should be put in the position of being able to be as flexible as it can in a changing fishery. And wherever it's possible to allow an additional couple of days or, or another couple of tons of a fishery where people are, are cut so close to the bone most of the time, it just seems as though that latitude is somewhat uh, sacrificed by that. But uh, that's it for me. I'm, I'll support the motion. And, uh, well, yeah, but if Bill, if the, if the motion fails, then it means we're status quo. We'll have a, a June 9th, uh, you know, uh, scheduled end date with the allowance for the director to extend uh, beyond June 9th. And I'm, I'm willing to do that. Yeah, well, I'm, I'm willing to support the motion because you, you put it out here and this is what I believe you feel is the right thing to do. But those are my feelings on it. Thank you, Bill. Questions? Bill. Bill, the floor is yours. Are you on mute? Thank you, thank, you, thank you, Jared. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Chairman. I appreciate it. Um, I have a couple of uh, comments. Uh, some of them are, are optics, and some of them are my personal feelings. Um, I, I, I attended the, the June Six, uh, the January 6th meeting. Uh, it, was a, it was a lengthy meeting. I, it was three plus hours long. And um, there were approximately 11 attendees, if I look at my notes, from the public involved. And there were 16 panelists there. The panelists can, you know, comprising DMF folks and also three members of the Marine Fisheries Advisory Commission. Um, I don't recall, I'm thinking back, I don't recall any, any representatives from the, the Massachusetts seafood or squid industry in attendance, uh, but there was a, a person, uh, I believe her name was Katie Almeida, and she was from Rhode Island, and she's the senior representative uh, for, I guess, government relations and sus sustainability. Uh, she represented an organization, I believe it's called the Town Dock, she spoke at the public hearing and also provided written comment in favor of this recommendation. I, I didn't hear very much public comment from, from uh, the Massachusetts fishery, or the squid industry, uh, seafood industry. So that was a little bit of a concern to me. And, um, and then I read the nine written comments that were submitted to DMF, only nine regarding this recommendation where four were in favor of it. Uh, and five were against this recommendation. One of the one of the four in favor again was Katie Almeida from Rhode Island. Uh, I, I've spoken to Director McKiernan, and I have read the various documents that were supplied dealing with this with this fishery. Um, and I, and as Dan said, there are two sides of the story, and I can see both sides of the picture regarding this this particular action item. Um, my feelings, those are objects of my feelings. My feelings, uh, my personal feelings is that the recommendation, if it were to pass, um, I feel would lead to less flexibility in future decision-making uh, regarding this particular fishery. You know, especially understanding uh, that future climatic, climatic weather changes and other factors, abiotic factors, could or might affect the squid population densities and locations at any one particular time. 
And if this were the case, it might require future appropriate decision making and provisions to optimize the fishery. That is maybe with the with the ocean temperatures warming or conditions changing, maybe this fishery might have to be changed from the current start date and end date to another start date and end date. Uh, and I, I think by by having the, the having this this particular action item go through is going to limit that flexibility to be able to to make those changes. Now I I may be not understanding the entire fishery management uh, altogether, but these are my feelings, and I just feel that you're going to lessen the flexibility to optimize the fishery in the future. Thank you. We all, if if I could respond. Um... You make an interesting point about uh, ocean changes or changes in the ocean environment. So it was at, at our recommendation back when Phil Coates was the director that we, we do open the fishery a week early uh, in April uh, 23rd, because I think uh, around that time, mid nineties, we actually had a year that was really warm spring and squid had shown up before May 1st, which was the traditional opening. But I can tell you from experience, um, we have had very little uh, uh, you know, trend or, or, or presence of squid up until like the last couple of days of, of April. And it's, they typically find them on Collier's Ledge around uh, the, the, uh, the Centerville area uh, or off of Osterville. And then on May 1st, of course, the, uh, that area closes. Um, the, the longstanding mobile gear closure closes. So we actually don't see any earlier arrival, which I guess I would have expected, you know, with, with ocean warming, that this thing might shift kind of to the, to the left, like with an earlier arrival and maybe an earlier, earlier uh, flaming out of the fishery. Um, instead, what I, what I think we're seeing, uh, as evidenced by the intense trawling that, that went on south of the islands um, during the uh, period of like 2012 to 2016, when uh, many of the folks kind of got up in arms, especially around Nantucket, because they saw a lot of effort off their shores, is that there's been a trend in squid away from maybe the Long Island, New Jersey area, and, and uh, maybe we're sitting on a more optimal temperature regime here to the east. And so I think there's been, uh, well, it's been documented, more squid is taken to the east, so the Martha's Vineyard itself in Nantucket than had been in the past. So... I take your point. I, I appreciate that, and um, and I'm not I'm not opposed to maintaining status quo. I, I just want to um, have the the backing of the commission uh, on on the principles of, of what the purpose of an extension would be. And at this point, and I'm thinking it would be primarily um, catch rates. As long as the catch rates of squid stayed high, uh, and of course, you know, we we can look at the sea sampling data each. Each uh, each year, but we don't we don't think we can look at it in real time. We can kind of keep an eye on the on the sea sampling uh, results, but it's not something we can use to make instant uh, decisions. Thank, Thank you, Khalil. Thank you, Mike. Garrett. Michael Piedknock, you're mm -hmm. recognized. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, uh, and thank you, Dan. Um, you know. Much of what uh, Khalil said, I, I agree with, and were some points that I, I were going to make. Uh, uh, you know, the public comments uh, included uh, during the, the, the webinar, um, as well as via email, uh, the recreational and for hire community on Nantucket continues to be impacted by this small mesh uh, fishing uh, and has a detrimental impact on they're fishing with, within uh, the Nantucket waters. So uh, they, they're concerned with the additional days and uh, how that would continue to have a detrimental impact on them. I, I think the, the climatic shift issues that we have multiple lines of evidence with multiple species of where that's taking place uh, that has me concerned. And, and uh, you know, you pointed out, Dan, that uh, you haven't seen such with squid, but who knows if they're next? That I I, I prefer if you we you were, would be provided the flexibility to just keep it as is, 
uh, status quo in the event that was to occur. Um, but what intrigued me most was the lack of the state of uh, commercial fleet commenting on this. And, uh, um, and it was basically silent. So, you know, ultimately, uh, I, I'm for status quo uh, as a result of, uh, you know, what's been stated by me as well as Khalil. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. Jared Hands. <clears throat> Shelly? Shelly Edmondson, you're recognized. Thank you, Chairman um, and uh, Dan. I just wanted to echo Khalil and Mike's points and concerns. Um, I, I do feel the same and feel like the status quo allows the flexibility in a, um, you know, a very highly variable fishery. And I do recognize that the extension is challenging to forecast and there's data limitations, but I think that just extending it out without considering the, those changes um, doesn't seem like the right call right now. Um, so anyway, I, I just, I think there's a lot of concerns on both sides and I've spoken to people on both fronts. And I, I think this maintaining the status quo seems like the best thing right now. Thank you. Thank you, Shelley. Jared, hands. Khalil? Khalil. Yeah, yes. Mind. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I want to get back to the flexibility part about it. Um, and uh, as I said, I can see I can see both sides to it, but and I, again, Shelley just touched on it a little bit. It, it, and Dan said also about the, the squid showing up, uh, you know, the last couple of days in, in April. A scenario. If, if this were to pass, if this were to pass and um, the, the, the weather's horrible or for whatever, whatever reason, the conditions, the, this, this, the squid fishery is terribly off and, and, and it's not being optimized. And then we get to that extension date that if it were to pass that, that, had, that we had proposed, there's no option. There's absolutely no option and, and the squid fishery is starting to improve and we have to shut it down at a particular date. We're not op optimizing that fishery because we have a, we have a, a shutdown, date, shutdown date that cannot be extended. And that's, that's, what I, that's what I think we're talking about, the flexibility. Granted, there's a lot of scrambling, uh, you know, a couple of days or three days beforehand. And, and I guess it's up to, it behooves the, the industry the squid industry, the dealers, and the and the uh, the trawlers to to get that information expeditiously to DMF so that the director, whoever it might be in the future, Dan's not going to be here forever, can make a decision as to yes, I need to extend this thing more than just nine days, more than just ten days. However, you know, if the fishery's been way off, we're going to extend this thing until we're satisfied that. The the, uh, the the squitters have gotten their their uh, their what they what they need. So it's the flexibility. It's the flex flexibility that that concerns me. The lack of flexibility. If this were to pass, Thanks. I appreciate that, Khalil. So if if I'm hearing both of the commission members here uh, that have spoken so far, you'd you'd like to be to maintain the flexibility. And Khalil, you've identified a good way to monitor the the fishery would be through. Uh, sort of verified, uh, you know, like dealer reports. I'm comfortable with that, and and if that's the case, you know, I will withdraw this recommendation and um, and keep it as status quo because um, I I I'm I'm hearing you know some pr pretty good advice here, and I do want to uh, be flexible uh, because there are some highly variable conditions in this fishery. So, is there any objection to me? withdrawing this, this recommendation and keeping the regulation static? I'm not seeing any objections. Okay, yeah, why don't we do that? Um, I, I appreciate um, your input. I appreciate your guidance. I uh, appreciate the, the comments that we got. And Khalil, I, I agree with you. I was also disappointed in the lack of turnout at this hearing. And it is something I'm gonna work on, you know, Darren, I and Story 
are, are also talking about convening that, that same fleet to talk about the summer flounder fishery. Uh, somehow, I mean, I know there aren't many boats left, but somehow they, they, uh, they were sleeping on this one in terms of the, the fact that this was going on. Maybe it was so close to the holidays uh, and they just didn't uh, you know, get the announcement over the Christmas or whatever to know that this thing was scheduled. But we'll try to engage better with that fleet and, um, and we'll take it from there. So thank you for that. Thank you, Director McKiernan. Great. Moving on, trap tag installation deadline. This is an action item. Let's move this along, Jared. Who's got this, Dan? I can take this one. Uh, it, it really couldn't be much simpler. The uh, trap tag deadline as written now is a June 1st deadline. Uh, except, of course, in Area 3, where, where the federal government requires new tags to be put on. Um, and a second caveat is there's a, there is an old remnant rule on the Outer Cape that says it's like March, uh, mid-March, but that, that was back when the Outer Cape closure uh, uh, was lifted uh, seasonally on March 16th. Now we've got the closure uh, in the, uh, thanks to the Mass Bay restricted area in combination with our closure, uh, you know, nobody's lobster fishing uh, north of the Cape and state waters until at least May 1st. And so we suggest that we should have a May 1st uh, deadline for the, uh, for the affixing of the next year's, or the new year's trap tags. That way, uh, you know, under the old rules, someone could travel to go out to sea with last year's tag traps, the previous years, and it would not be illegal. So under the new rule, it would be um, Ill illegal to um, be setting traps uh, without a valid trap tag uh, once that fishery opened in that zone. And as far as area two goes, uh, we would just be amending the, the same standard. It would become a May 1st uh, opening day, but the area two fishery, of course, isn't subjected to that same closure. But nonetheless, simple proposal, didn't get any opposition at public hearing on it. Okay, open it up to discussion. Has anybody got questions or do they need to discuss this action item? Jared, any hands? Not saying any hands. Sookie, did you have a comment? Uh, I just going to make a motion. Okay. All right, Suki. Make the motion to move it to May 1st. Second. Okay. Thank you. I need the second. Who's that, Bill Amaru? That was Bill Amaru, yeah. Thank you, Bill. Uh, roll call vote once again. And uh, Bill Doyle had to step away, so we will be lacking his vote on this motion. Michael Piednock. Yes. Suki Sawyer. Yes. Tim Brady. Tim Brady. Tim Brady. Mr. Chair, why don't you come back to Tim? We may have stepped away for a moment. Lou Williams. Yes. Shelly Edmondson. Yes. Bill Amaru. Yes. Khalil. Yes. And coming back to Tim Brady. Tim Brady, yes. It's unanimous. Six to six to zero with one abstention. Yes. Six to zero, one abstention. Seven to zero and one one abstention. We've got eight voting members. Okay, we'll move this along. Recommendation on the winter period stuff limits. Dan, who's going yeah, to answer I'm, I'm going to hand it off to Jared, but this is a, uh, a proposal that is going to um, negate the need for this commission to be taking these annual votes to establish these trip limits. We're putting the, uh, we're writing the rule in such a way that the, the federal uh, permit holders are going to be subjected to the federal standards and uh, we're gonna uh, institute a more liberal in-state waters rule so that we don't have to go to annual rulemaking through this commission to simply adopt the federal standards. Jared, take it away. Yeah, I'm not sure what else there is to add to that. Uh, so, you know, every 
September, we come to you and ask to set the winter two limits commensurate with the federal limits. And then December, we come to you and ask to set the winter one limits commensurate with the federal limits. What this does is basically say, if you're fishing in federal waters, um, you can land, possess and land fish in Massachusetts in accordance with the federal limits. And if you're fishing in Massachusetts waters, you're subject to a 2000 pound scuff limit during these winter periods, which is effectively October 1 through April 30th. That 2000 pound limit matches the maximum um, limit allowed uh, of trawlers fishing with small mesh, which is probably the gear type that's going to catch the largest amount of scuff in state waters. And that may be occurring during that last week of April when the squid fishery is open. You know, in the shoulder seasons, there's not going to be much state waters catch. I mean, there's going to be none during the winter period and during the shoulder period. There's going to be a pretty small amount of state waters catch outside that squid fishery, given um, you know the the limitations on night fishing, on mesh size. Um, so we're comfortable saying it's a 2,000 pound limit for state waters fishing throughout the winter one and winter two periods and then setting the federal having federal boats be able to fish under the federal limits as we do with the ground fish fleet or the stall fleet so that, that that i think probably gives a little bit more detail to dan's overarching view so that's our recommendation on this okay let's open it to discussion and questions no questions or comments from what i can see mr chair and let's move the motion. I need somebody to move the motion. Shelly. I make the motion. Thank Khalil. you, Shelly. I need a second. Khalil, second. Roll call vote once again. Michael Pierdnock. Yes. Suki Sawyer. Yes. Tim Brady. Yes. Lou Williams. Yes. Shelly Edmondson. Yes. Bill Amaru. Yes. Leo Bogdan. Yes. And I presume Bill Doyle, you're still awake? It so is, Mr. Chair. It passes seven in favor, one abstention. Eight in, yeah. Okay, let's move this along. Items for future public hearings, commercial spiny dogfish trip limits for 2022. Who's got this, Nicola? I do, yes. Mr. Chairman, thank you, good morning. Um, so the, the next two items, I'll cover the spiny dogfish trip limit and the bluefish minimum size uh, for the commercial fishery. These are both um, items that would go to public hearing in February and then come back before the commission at your March meeting for uh, um, the director's final recommendation and action. Um, regarding the commercial spiny dogfish trip limit, um, but at this point, both the, the New England and the Mid-Atlantic Council have um, voted in support of a increase from 6,000 pounds to 7,500 pounds for the federal waters trip limit. And so next week, the Atlantic States Marine Fisheries Commission will be looking at a complementary action for the state waters trip limit in the northern region, which is um, Maine through Connecticut, um, where there is a, a regional quota and hence a a, um, the ASMC also sets a, a maximum trip limit. So right now we're at 6,000 pounds and our proposal for a public hearing will be to take advantage of that expected um, liberalization to 7,500 pounds um, allowed after the ASMC um, votes next week. Um, and it's expected that, you know, if approved eventually this would go into place at the beginning of the, the May 1 season. Um, that, you know, the background here is that there's been a, a decline in um, the coastwide landings the last couple of years. There's um, quota under utilization going on. Um, there is um, trip uh, information that su suggests that the, the 6,000 pound um, limit is currently restricting the landings um, for the, you know, a majority of the trips. And, um, 
there was a prior analysis, some, some analysis of the, the prior two trip limit increases that suggests that this incremental increase, um, you know, is not expected to have a, uh, a negative impact on the, on the price paid per pound to harvesters. Um, so um, we'll take plan again to take this to public hearing to go to 7,500 pounds um, in February. And if there aren't any questions on that, Mr. Chairman, I'll just, I'll roll straight into um, Bluefish. Okay, any questions for Nicola on spiny dogfish? No, I'd say any questions, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Thank you, Nicola, right into Bluefish. All right, thank you. Um, on, on Bluefish, um, the division is looking to propose a 18 inch commercial minimum size for, for bluefish. There's currently no minimum size limit on commercial or recreationally. And, and this is being proposed not as a, a commercial fishery conservation measure, but more of a, a, a recreational um, enforcement issue. Um, uh, two years ago, the, the recreational limits for bluefish were decreased from a 10 fish bag limit to um, three or five fish, depending on, on the mode, be it uh, private anglers um, or for uh, those aboard for higher vessels. And we've gotten reports from, um, you know, first from from the public and, and those were um, confirmed by, by law enforcement that there are some individuals who are um, skirting, you know, those, recre those lower recreational allowances by getting a very affordable commercial rod and reel permit in order to take um, bluefish at higher um, numbers. And, uh, you know, it's unlikely that those are being um, accounted for either recreationally or commercially in the harvest. Um, and it is, you know, the, the three and five fish bag limits for bluefish were implemented in order to avoid a, an overage of the recreational harvest limit. So, um, you know, it is a, a conservation issue uh, for people to be um, evading those regulations through, um, you know, what is kind of a, a loophole because the bluefish commercial permit endorsement is open to entry. Um, or there, there is no bluefish, you know, um, rod and reel permit. So it's, it's very easy to, you know, um, claim to be harvesting these commercially. Um, so, you know, this seemed like a, the, a commercial minimum size looked like, seems to be a, a approach that will not impact the, the commercial fishery based on our current understanding of, you know, the, the market, um, demand for size and some limited sea sampling data or port sampling data that we have. Um, but we'll certainly be looking for a comment um, in February about the, the specific of the minimum size that we've proposed, which again would be, will be 18 inches. Questions for Nicola? Jared? Not seeing any hands raised. Bill Amaru. Bill, you recognize. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Hi, Nicola. Uh, did you say what the other states, I, I might not have heard everything you said, uh, have for their minimum sizes? Um, on the commercial fishery, yes. Uh, yes. Rhode, Rhode Island has an 18 inch size limit as well, um, which I, I believe that they implemented it based on, um, you know, at a, a size and maturity um, um, analysis. Um, further south, there are some states that have size limits that range between 8 and 12 inches. Um, for some of those, they essentially don't have a commercial fishery for bluefish. So it's really, that's what they have for their recreational size limit, and they just apply it across the board. Um, and there's some states that, do, that, similar to us right now, don't have a commercial minimum size in place. Okay. Well, I, the, uh, the one net boat that we do have in the state that uses the strike net his mesh size is five inches. I don't think he catches very many fish. Uh, that would be minimum size anyway, or close to the minimum size. But yeah, this this is a good one to go to public hearing. I hope that you get good input at that time. So I favor it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Bill. Any other questions for Nicola? I'm not seeing any hands raised. Chair, I'll pull the agenda back up for you. Yeah, recreational Georgia's bank cod limits. I presume Melanie's going to carry this. Yes. Thank you. Melanie, you're recognized. 
Sure, and I think Jared may want to hop in here. Sorry, one second. Yeah, you got echo. Um, so recently, the Groundfish Committee did provide some recommendations on recreational Georgia's bank, or excuse me, the framework uh, 63 implemented some changes, and this has to do with uh, reductions to the catch target. Recall there's not a sub ACL. Um, Jared, I'm not sure, did you have a slide for this? I, I don't have a specific slide for, for, for that, just, just that one. Just okay. So I think the intent, and Jared, this is where you're going to have to hop in on process, is that we intend to uh, mirror what mirror comes what out of the out federal of the process with uh, emergency action, and then we'll take public comment on that late in the spring. Um, so again, the council has uh, provided its recommendations. Always, we have to wait for the final rule coming out of the feds, but this would be for a slot limit, uh, 22 inches to 28 inches. It would newly close wave three in the first half of wave four um, and uh, provide, provide a bag limit too. So we will, once we get the federal rule, the final rule from the feds on this, which I would anticipate would be pretty close to the start of the fishing year, we'll enact a complimentary emergency action and then take public comment if I have that right, Jared. Yeah, that's correct. And, and, and in addition to that, what the slide shows is as there may be adjustments to Scuff and Black Sea Bass with decisions forthcoming, that those would probably all be packaged together as one item. We don't have the exact details on those other species. Um, and again, it'll be following the federal rulemaking process. So, you know, we'll, we'll, we're going to keep you abridged on these three recreational fishing items over the next couple of months as they evolve. But the but the kind of broader picture story here is once we have a sketch of what this is going to be, you know, if there's a potential for public scoping because multiple options exist, as there may be for scuff or black sea bass, uh, less likely for Georgia's Bay because I'll just be mirroring a federal rule. We'll do some public scoping, but the, the, we'll be filing emergency regs to get this in place for, you know, as close to May 1 as possible uh, or before May 1 if possible. Um, and then hold public hearings following that for a final rule to be approved by the commission, maybe in June. So that's, that kind of outlines the process on that. Uh, Bill Amaru. Thank you. Uh, I assume that because we're talking about George's Bank Cod without a designation for East and West, it's both uh, subsections of the fishery, East and West. Melanie? I'm sorry, could you? I'm sorry, could you? Yeah, the, the Georgia's Bank cod fishery is divided into east and west. And west. Since there's no designation, designation, does this apply to both east and west? Uh, you're talking about like the uh, eastern Georgia's Bank cod versus western Georgia's Bank cod? Yes, yes. Um, the, yeah, the, I mean, this is recreational, so there's no real designation. That, that's really a commercial designation in terms oh. of how the quota gets allocated, but this is on recreational Georgia's Bank cod. So it's the entire Georgia's Bank fishery? Correct. Thank you. Mike, you're not Michael, you recognize. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Melanie. Uh, with with the proposed timeline here, would we have uh, an answer by May first? Um, I I can't really speak to that because it's that'll be a federal process. Uh, I in years past, uh, as you know, Mike, it's it can go right up into the wire and even into the fishery. You know, sometimes it's not till August if it's not um, going to impact what the rules might be. I'm hoping that they will have something by May 1, but that's why we do it like this, because it's very hard for the states to uh, enact something without knowing uh, definitely what the feds are going to approve. Um, so it's a, a tight timeline. That's why we do the emergency followed by public hearing. Thank you. Is the same for the Black Sea Bass and SCUP? Nicola? Um, so we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about this in detail in the, the ASMC update um, section, but, but yeah, there's, there's still um, council and commission meetings occurring this 
uh, next month that we're that are gonna have a lot of influence on on the timing of what we may or may not be looking at for regulatory changes for CBS and SCUP. But if we do have to make changes, they would be emergency action. Thank you. I'll, I'll leave my questions uh, for the Atlantic States Marine Fishery Commission discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. Bill Bill Amaro, you're recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, could someone tell me what, what the limits con currently are on bag limits and size limits? Yeah, Bill, well, give me one second. I can pull that off. I think it's a year round open season with a 10 fish bag limit and a 24 inch minimum size. But if I get my big black book out, I can let you know. Well, that's, that's close enough. Uh, the point I want to make is we, we've had a really, really substantial cut in Georgia's cod this year for the commercial fishery, 70 percent. Um, I'm, I'm just wondering, is, is this designed to be an effort to cut back on the recreational fishery as well? I, I just wanted to know if there's a connection between the, the state of the fishery and the belief that our, our, our take is substantial enough that we have to have these kinds of drastic cuts. Uh, is, is that pretty much what's driving this? Yeah, you got it. That's um, so. This is all coming out of the recent framework for for ground fish that sets the specs for the upcoming years. And um, you know, we had a couple different stocks that are in rebuilding. Uh, you know, they're not doing well, including Gulf of Maine cod and Southern New England winter. But Georgia's Bank cod became the focus because of the recent assessment. And so uh, there's a cut that's flowing down from the cut to the ABC. If you recall, there was some discussion at the SSC and at the council about what that ABC should be. The council approved a one-year recommendation that comes out of this data poor assessment. And so the SSC will actually go back and talk about what it'll be for 2023 and 2024. But in terms of the recreational and the commercial cuts, I think the, the cut to, as you said, to the ABC for commercial, or excuse me, the ACL for commercial is on the order of like 70%. But in terms of utilization, it's maybe 60%. And what's happening with the REC Georgia's Bank COD catch target is around a 50, 60% reduction. I think it was about 143 in previous years, and we're going down to about 75 metric tons. And so then how to enact that cut is... Uh, the decision behind these seasons and bag limits and size limits so that the catch stays within that catch target. All right, I, I understand and I understand and it's appropriate, unfortunate, but appropriate. Thank you. Any more discussion on these items? Not seeing any other hands raised, Mr. Chair, I'll bring the agenda back up. To yeah. All right, we're moving on to uh, discussion items, protected species update. Yeah, Ray, uh, Bob Glenn is going to lead that discussion. Uh, yes, good right. morning, Mr. Chair. Good morning, Commissioners. Um, Jerry, well, you let me that? know when you want the slides. Yep. Yes, please. Uh, so this morning, what I... The biggest update that I have for the commission is a, a recent re proposal request that Division Marine Fisheries has received from uh, five uh, fishermen, coastal lobster permit holders who have, and some of them also hold federal permits, who have requested uh, authorization to fish in the Mass Bay restricted area, which is, as you well know, is the is the closure uh, that we have from February first through M May fifteenth to. Uh, to all lobster fishing in Mass State waters from roughly Chatham to the New Hampshire state border um, to protect endangered North Atlantic right whales. Um, this was submitted on, on behalf of a group called the, the Pioneers for a Thoughtful Existence. Um, and I worked with the, uh, the, these five fishermen and their proponents to put together, submit a formal proposal to DMF, which we heard at a public meeting last week uh, which I'm, I'm sure Jared and Dan will uh, summarize the results of that meeting later on, but I'll just quick, very briefly go through it. As I mentioned, uh, there are five uh, permit holders who are requested to fish in that area. Uh, those are listed here. They're Rob Martin, 
Michael Lane, John Havlin, Tim Crussell, and Joseph Barrow. Uh, their respective home ports and fishing vessels are listed there. The rationale of this proposal is to test the operational efficacy of on-demand fishing system, also known as ropeless fishing systems, um, in the in the closed area. Uh, <clears throat> through this, they'll also collect data on efficiency of hauling and setting ropeless fishing gear, collect data on premature release and effectiveness of a, a Blue Ocean Gear Smart Buoy, which is a system that is a, a GPS uh, tracking buoy that would uh, indicate the, the potential for an early release. Um, they would also collect data on successful acoustic trigger rates, test the effectiveness and durability of on-demand fishing gear in, in winter conditions. In addition to this, the, the rationale behind this proposal is to test the operational efficacy of a, electronic gear marking systems. Specifically, the proponents are going to are proposing to use the Edge Tech um, Smart Tracker, uh, excuse me, trap tra excuse me, trap tracker system, and this is a, a cloud-based system that's based off a, a phone uh, app that a fisherman mark to the beginning and end of their trawls virtually uh, when they're setting ropeless gear and that is shared with the other proponents um, of the other folks participating in this that so they would know where that gear was and they will collect data on gear conflict and uh, with other participants using on-demand fishing gear and finally the other rationale behind this proposal is to demonstrate the potential for fishing with on-demand gear in, in general next next slide please the two areas that are being proposed are highlighted here. The pink area, Zone A, is to the north. Um, it, 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 preliminarily, there were th uh, proposal was for three fishermen to fish in this area, Zone A, uh, and it's projected that there could be up to 20 trawls fished in there in this area. And then down below, there could be an additional in Zone B, the green area marked on this map. Um, there would be three fishermen fishing in that particular area, and that is uh, could have up to a maximum of 28 trials in the initial proposal. Next slide, please. Um, in general, a summary of the fishing practices and the gear they'll be using, each fisher would fish up to a maximum of 10, 20 trap trials. Each trawl would be fitted with an acoustic release and pop-up buoy on one end on one end of the gear manufactured by edge tech five of the trawls would be outfitted with an acoustic release and inflatable popped up system also manufactured by smelts so this was to try the, the uh, additional trials related to uh, uh, another system that the smelt system uses uh, in inflation technology um, with the exception of state and federal vertical line requirements all existing regulations would be adhered to and as a result of this proposal, there's an estimated 117 hauls of on-demand fishing gear would be completed uh, during the trial. And down below is a, a, a projection by the proponents of how many hauls per month by each fisherman would occur. And also, it, it should be noted in this, um, out of the five fishers who are in this proposal, two are state waters only. Those are highlighted in blue. Um, and then the other three are state and federal permit holders. A key distinction with the white uh, individuals are those who are duly permitted, in addition to uh, needing a DMF letter of authorization to fish during the closed area, all federally permitted vessels would also need an experimental fisheries permit issued by the National Marine Fisheries Service that would preempt um, DMF's issuance of a, a state permit. Next, next slide, please. Um, the proponents uh, propose the following best practices and, and risk management strategies. Under best practices, the ground line and on-demand vertical lines would contain unique marking buoys with regional requirements, and at a minimum, additional black and yellow and black strips marks as noted in the regulation. Uh, they would fly; each vessel would fly a unique fly, flag um, to for enforcement recognition. Uh, stored vertical lines would, will be enhanced. So in a pop-up system, all the buoy lines, instead of being in the water column, are they are packed into the pop-up system. 
um, but in the in, to ensure that uh, additional safety to protected species in the event of a premature release, they propose that all those lines would also be fitted with a South Shore sleeve, which breaks at 1,700 pounds, and it is um, compliant with um, both state and federal rules relative to weak uh, fishing gear, and those would be instituted at every 40 feet. As I mentioned earlier, a proportion a, a portion of those gear would also be utilizing blue ocean gear smart buoy systems, which would be used as an additional test to measure the potential for premature release. Uh, grappling is not intended uh, to be used as an alternative fishing method, and but may be required as uh, in the in the re, in the event of failures. And if this is to occur, the proponents would record the reasons why. Um, and document that and, and try to avoid future need of that. Under risk management, uh, project vessels will operate within the 10 knot speed limit specific to project work as an extended precaution. Any vessel finding itself within the 500 yard, 1500 foot buffer zone created by a surfacing right whale must depart immediately at a safe and slow speed in accordance with current right whale approach rules. The trap track, tracker system application will be utilized for retrieval and setting and set position details and made available to federal state corresponding environment personnel. So all, all the information relative to the where that gear would be set uh, would be shared uh, real time with state federal officials and, and also law enforcement. Um, and finally, the gear will not be retrieved with known right whales in close proximity. And next slide. And finally, um, under coordination and communication with DMF, uh, weekly communication and, re and reporting to state and federal personnel on current fishing activities within the project area will occur. Project monitoring, data collection, analysis, and reporting continues in collaboration with the Northeast Fishery Science Center and under Northeast Fishery Science Center protocols. Uh, we would the, re the proponents. Uh, support weekly mandatory gear loss reporting and are willing to work with DMF and NIMS to use real time surveillance to avoid hauling gear when right whale aggregations are present. Next slide. Uh, just a little background as you just to give you to orientate you to the situation, the area that they're proposing here um, falls within uh, and the map on the left is the mass the mass restricted area trap gear closure from February 1st to May 15th. The pink area is the historical uh, trap closure area that has occurred that has been in existence since 2015. And the red area is the newly expanded area up in the, the northern portion of Mass State Waters that uh, the Commission um, approved back um, last year for it went into effect in the, in 2021. And on the right is uh, the most updated um, whale surveillance information from well maps and this is just the from the time period of february 1st through may 15th for the years of 2017 through 2021 the last five years this just shows the distribution of whales that have been detected the dark gray being definite def visual um, detections through aerial surveillance the the red being definite approved uh, confirmed acoustic detections through both static and glider uh, observations and yellow being uh, possible acoustics yet to be confirmed. And so the, the take home is that in general, that in the last five years, right whale distribution throughout Massachusetts has been, in this time period has been um, fairly uh, consistent and, and, and fairly expansive across our state waters. Next slide, and I think that's probably that's it. All. That's it. I'm yeah. So back to the first slide that has the pre uh, request on it. Yeah. Thanks. And so, um, so that this was heard last week um, at a, a public meeting um, it was, that was very well attended. Uh, and then I, I will turn the details of that meeting over to Jared and Dan, who can who can better <laughs> outline um, the comment we heard and in, 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 in what direction. Thank you. Thank you, Bob. Jared, or Dan, who's going to lead this? I'm going to give this to Dan. Dan. Yeah, that's up. right. Um, so I, I don't want to get the, 
too involved. Uh, the purpose for us to just to talk about this today is to just give the commission an update. And uh, as by a way of background, recall that uh, while the state has closed the area to all lobster fishing, the federal government amended their version of the same closures to close to persistent buoy lines. So uh, NIMS is paving uh, the way forward to allow this kind of, uh, you know, uh, uh, gear development to take place. They would be giving out what's called exempted fishing permits. Uh, they have a gear cache down at their Northeast Fishery Science Center. And it's my understanding, they all only want to give uh, the gear out uh, to those who are going to sort of further the the uh, development of this technology and to do uh, some work, um, you know, with, with some kind of rigorous protocols. So, you know, that's that's the challenges I face. If you heard the hearing the other night, you would have heard, uh, you know, many lobstermen are, uh, are vehemently uh, opposed to, to the development of this technology. I, I don't want to paraphrase them, but what I heard from them is that you know, their, their four and a half, the three and a half month closure, the incorporation of weak rope, um, and, and now this new line marking um, in, in combination has resulted in a substantial reduction in risk uh, for entanglement in Massachusetts in excess of 90% over the 2014 baseline. And so it's really a fundamental uh, challenge for us to try to figure out, you know, is this necessary? Uh, it, can it be done? Uh, there's a huge amount of cost associated with this technology, um, even though the, the devices are, are prototypes, uh, or I should say because they're prototypes, so they're, you know, it's, they're not available in mass production. They're very expensive. They cost around $4,000. Each of these fishermen who would be participating would be the beneficiaries of about $45,000 in, in financial support by virtue of obtaining the gear for free. And um, and I think the the, the fishermen by uh, the fishermen on the outside looking in uh, have fears that this not may not be scalable in terms of the cost, but also um, there were serious questions about how close this gear could be fished uh, together, which is a very typical of the lobster fishery. Um, and then you know the the, the bigger question is uh, this is a proposal to re regain access to a closed area. But there were many in the environmental community who see this as the future of lobster fishing, period, and, uh, and envision that this is just a matter of time and it's necessary to, to do this R&D so that uh, one day um, there won't be vertical lines in the water. And, you know, this is going to change uh, fishing drastically, not only in terms of cost, which I've just outlined. So if it costs $45,000 for a fisherman to fish a quarter of his gear, well, you can see it's going to be over $160,000 to fish all of the gear under that, that uh, scenario. And so you've got cost issues. There's also serious questions about whether the, the small boat fishery could survive this because people who fish single traps couldn't afford these devices, nor could student lobstermen, recreational lobstermen, people who fish out of skiffs, you know, can't fish long trawls. So there's some serious, uh, you know, uh, implications in the long term. But meanwhile, um, I've got to um, deal uh, with this uh, with this issue. Uh, we're, we're we're looking at it. Uh, I just yesterday, I think we got a text message that now two of the fishermen are no longer uh, part of this program. So it's a little chaotic. Uh, but I know my staff are going to help me uh, kind of figure this out. We are doing our best to work with the National Marine Fisheries Service to figure out their their approach to these exempted fishing permits. And as Bob mentioned earlier, because the remaining participants are all federally permitted, uh, those vessels would have to get the exempted fishing permit uh, from them uh, as well as from us. So uh, we will be working with the National Marine Fisheries Service. And I don't believe that their process uh, is, is as quick as ours could be. So it may be a couple of months uh, before this, uh, this, this sees the light of day. So, but we're gonna be working with with those, uh, with those regulators, we'll be uh, speaking closely to the to the uh, Northeast Fisheries Science Center about this and and other ways to to test this because the the fishermen who spoke are, are, are truly concerned that the um, that the there are there are unresolved questions of, about how this gear could be integrated into the fishery as we know it. In other words, the uh, is about 
300,000 traps in Massachusetts waters and, and those all depend on uh, being set by fishermen who visually can see uh, the other fishermen's uh, buoys and without the ability to know the presence of those buoys, uh, there's, a, there's many fishermen who, who've expressed desire for, to me that, uh, that they, they may not continue in the profession because of the, the risk and the expected losses. So this is a really difficult uh, issue and it's made even more difficult with kind of the changing uh, details of this as they come forward with people uh, withdrawing, et cetera. So uh, Bob, is that, is that a fair summary of uh, where we're at as a group? Yeah, Dan, I think you hit the nail on the head. That that kind of summarizes it. Um, you know, we're we're continuing to work with the proponents in National Marine Fisheries Service over the next several weeks. And um, given that now that, that the three remaining uh, proponents um, who are seeking access are also federal permit holders, this will require, you know, kind of close, close collaboration with National Marine Fisheries Service um, and to see their process through relative to um, them receiving a federal experimental fisheries permit or excuse yeah. me, exempted fisheries permit. Yeah, okay. Uh, so he, Bob, go ahead, Is it Jared. Oh, Bob, I, I was gonna take questions if you were ready for that then. Sure. Suki, so, you're recognized. Yeah, I don't have any questions, uh, Dan. I just got comments and if you wanna hear questions first, I'll. Uh, wait, but if you want to talk about comments, I'll just comment. Suki, you have the floor. Okay. Uh, I safely can say that I represent the majority of lobstermen in the state of Massachusetts, and I have not received one phone call from anybody saying that I thought this was a good idea. To have a science project in a, in a sterile environment doesn't provide any science at all. The industry is dead against this, but rational minds want people to test this so they can show that it doesn't work. That's the big question that's out there. So everybody thinks this is not gonna work in an everyday fishing situation. And I agree with that. It's just not possible for all this data to be on a cell phone screen so other fishermen can look at it. And it's just, incon incon yeah, incon whatever, it's, I'm so upset by this that I can't even think what I want to say, but the, the science project by five fishermen that are working, have been working with these companies in, a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in an area where right whales congregate at this 100% close right now and have to put them at some kind of risk, whatever how low it is, to try some experimental fisheries things is just not possible. It should not happen and it shouldn't be allowed. And I won't even get into the cost of this. And you can say goodbye to the little boat fishermen in this industry if this goes far, it goes very far forward from here. I'll leave my comments at that. Thank you. Thank you, Suki. Does anybody else want to comment on this? Mike Pirinoff. Michael, you recognize. <clears throat> uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And thank you for your presentation. Uh, a question, and I have a few comments. Um, if this was to take place and you're a recreational vessel for hire vessel or commercial vessel, why, when if I was to go to that area and fish in that area, how would I know that the traps are present within that area? That's my first question. Bob, you want to take a crack at that? So in, in this particular experiment, the, the only the folks who would be aware of where their spear is, it would be the five proponents who would be participating, who are using the trap tap tracker information, as well as officials like myself from DMF and National Marine Fisheries Service and law enforcement, who would be given the opportunity to view the location of that gear on trap tracker. Michael. Uh, thank you. Uh, I mean, uh, I'd be concerned that whether you're rec for hire or commercial, uh, you come into that area and you fish that area and you hook up and do this expensive equipment. So I know there was discussions, geez, about a year ago where this was brought up and I, I thought there'd be a mechanism uh, to do that, but it doesn't seem to be the case. Uh, a, a, a point of clarification is that if this experiment was to 
and counter, uh, I, I'm sorry if I don't know the appropriate word, you're not catching a right whale, you're harassing or, or do what's necessary then that you would have to take action as a result of that encounter. Does that one encounter then shut down the entire fishery in Massachusetts? Um, so, no. Uh, and, and so the, the I mean, it, it, it all depends. There's no single encounter that has the immediate consequence of shutting down the fishery. And so um, there's entanglements are classified in, into two separate categories. There's, they're always considered a take. And then within those that are takes under the Marine Mammal Protection Act, they assign each take a value as to whether it was a serious injury or mortality. And so uh, those that in, in which that are, they're successfully disentangled and the whale appears to be, be um, not very seriously injured, um, those are just listed as a take. In cases where the whale dies and or has, you know, really substantial industry in, injuries, those would be classified as a, as a serious injury and mortality. In that instance, that goes against what, what's called PBR, potential biological removals. Uh, in the other instance, it's just a take. At issue is that um, currently, as you're aware, the Division of Marine Fisheries is has been ordered by a federal judge to uh, obtain an incidental take permit. We're in the middle of that process, and what that take permit would allow us is to have and what we're hoping for is to allow some non-lethal takes. In other words, takes that don't uh, uh, result in a serious injury or mortality in the in, in the you know through the activity of commercial fishing with buoys. Um, we don't have that permit yet, so if it were to happen uh, in the near future, that would be um, uh, you know an unauthorized take. Uh, in the in the advent of it, that it was a, a lethal, serious injury, that that not only does that count against as a take, but also it counts against PBR and potentially has more serious ramifications. Um, you know, th that said, I will say the the opportunity for that um, is fairly limited. This technology relative to what's being proposed um, in in all the trials with this technology, they've had um, virtually no. Um, premature releases. And so the, the, the potential for entanglement is low. Thank you, Bob. One last thing then with that, in, in the event we, you would have an unfortunate outcome that the, the right whale would die or, uh, you know, an entanglement, uh, because Mass DMF has proposed this and will allow such if it was to move forward, as well as NOAA, the fact that we are in a litigious environment and most recently mass DMF w was uh, subject to a lawsuit as a result of right whales, would that then subject mass DMF once again to a potential lawsuit as a result of uh, an entanglement or a death? Well, it, it's hard for me um, to project what, what future actions can happen, but I, I can't imagine that um, it would be beneficial for us relative to our, our ongoing struggles with, with litigation and right whales. So yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to trying to answer as truthfully as I can. Yeah, I, I don't en envision that it, any, any kind of take that's attributable to Massachusetts fishing care would be beneficial for us uh, relative to uh, litigation or relative to our pursuit of an incidental take permit. I'm sorry, with that last question, uh, then wouldn't it be prudent to conduct such a study in an area well beyond our waters where there aren't right whales to assess whether there would be any whale entanglements? Or is this specific just for right whale entanglements? I, I wasn't clear whether it's specific for right whales or any type of whale, such as humpbacks or so on. As I just, you know, thinking out loud, then let's do it somewhere else where you don't have the potential to entangle a right whale. Yeah, so, uh, you know, again, I'll say that the, the, the entanglement r risk is low, um, but there, you know, th we do would have to accept some risk. Um, that's a great question. Um, I, you know, I think those are the kind of things that um, Director McKernan will be um, weighing out as he, as he, thinks about what you know 
whether or not and under what conditions this type of a permit could be issued. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's certainly something we're, we're concerned about and, and um, yeah, I, th that's about as much as I could answer on that, I think. Uh, thank you, Bob and Dan. This is a tough one. I, I appreciate your response. Thank you. Any more discussion on this? Lou Williams. Lou Williams, you're recognized. <clears throat> yeah, right. Um, yeah, I kind of reiterate the same thing that Asuki said. I mean, I'm getting calls from guys um that are told i haven't anyone that's, that's in favor of this and um my my concerns is the concerns that have been brought out with uh there's nothing really new to learn they know those buoy lines pop up okay so there's nothing to learn there but my biggest concern is because i wasn't able to listen to the public hearing but i listened to it the other night in in its entirety on youtube and um with the environmental community, just um, you just all all in favor of this. Um, there's nothing to do with getting lobstermen to be able to fish in the winter in uh, Mass Bay where there's no lobsters. It's all about the end goal, which is to make us all do this, which is what I feel is going on here. So you stop this; it's a slippery slope, and you're going to lose a lot of participants in this fishery if this ever happens. So. And, a, and I am the experts on the right whales, that pink area last year in May. Uh, we didn't really fish May, but we had the boat set up. Wanted to make sure everything was running right. So I just ran down there and set 10 nets in the open area and hauled them the next day just to make sure I didn't have any hydraulic issues or anything else when we started in June. And uh, <laughs> that place was full of right whales when I got there. Full of right whales. You know, one of the boats that went down the other day that he said when it opened, he, he didn't even set. There were so many right whales there. So so the experts aren't always right, is my point. And uh, I just think we're heading down a, a real slippery slope, even getting involved in this, you know, um, because this, is, uh, this isn't this is what the environmentalists want. They don't want fishermen to be able to fish in the winter when it's closed. They want this year round, and this will destroy this fishery. So. I would hope the state doesn't even consider being involved in the destruction of this uh, this fishery, which is which is going to be the outcome. So, okay, thanks. Anyone else? Khalil. Khalil. Thank, you, Bob. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Just just a quick question. Um, I, I attended that meeting. There were 108 participants pros and cons and it went back and forth um uh i guess the dmf is there is there a timeline that you have to make your decision decision regarding the loa that's a good question uh when we learned last night via a text message that two of the participants uh, withdrew uh then we've come to the conclusion that the National Marine Fishery Service has to issue the, the permits as well. So I think our, our deadline would be National Marine Fishery Service's deadline, which I don't know what that is, six, eight weeks or more. So, so, so in other words, th this is going to happen regardless? No, well, that not, I mean, there's a comparable application to the National Marine Fishery Service and they'll have to make their own decision as well. So I am, um, you know, I, I'm, I'm looking at it. I'm, I'm sensitive to a lot of the comments. I'm sensitive to the desire by the environmentalists to, to uh, you know, see some progress on, on this. I'm sensitive to the fishermen's concerns that there needs to be, uh, you know, testing. I mean, a lot of the folks who, are, who have weighed in with negative comments uh, are convinced that that uh, it's not going to be workable, and they'd like to see it tested in a way where that lack of of, uh, of, of workability can be exposed. Um, we have to look at this proposal to see whether the the, the work uh, would further the knowledge base of of these technologies, or if it's just a permit to um, to fish, if it's a carrot for 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 collaborators to um, to be, get access to a closed area. Yeah, I'm. I'm really. I'm really sensitive to, to Sookie's, uh, Sawyer's remarks before earlier, uh, but also on the other side, I, 
I'm a firm believer of uh, research uh, and evolution of technologies and evolution of techniques. Um, and so this is, this is, this is, you know, you're between a rock and a hard place in making this decision. And um, one side of me says, yeah, I think we should look at this and let it, let it, let it go forward and, and, and see how it works or doesn't work. And it's uh, baby steps. Uh, but the other side, I can, I can understand the concern and the fear from the Wasserman regarding the, the difference in technologies and also the cost to it. It's, uh, it, it, it could be prohibitive. And I, I so I, I'm feeling for Suki and, and the lobstermen, and but also on the other side, I'm I like the idea of the research. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Tim Brady. Tim, I recognize. Thank you. I've got um, a couple of points. Um, the first, which um, is is a real like personal concern of mine. Um, you know, I run a small head boat out of Plymouth. Um, the Captain John boats also run out of Plymouth. We anchor up, um, you know, for ground fishing on all the roughest bottom uh, around there, which is covered with lobster gear. So it's a constant, you know, kind of battle with us to, to make sure that when, you know, when we set our anchor, we're lined up with the trawls. So, you know, we're between one trawl and another trawl with enough space if we swing that we're, you know, and, you know, we're using pretty heavy Danforth anchors um, to not know where this ropeless gear is, is uh, problematic. So I'm just talking about, you know, the four higher head boats, but then you've got a hundred, um, you know, smaller boats and recreational boats. And they're also, they're following us around. I mean, wherever we go, they go and they're anchoring too. If, if it's that day, that's it's an anchor day, everybody's trying to set an anchor um, so not knowing where this gear is, I, I, I see a real conflict there. But even more important than that, it's hard for me to rationalize that we've done all of this work. We've rerouted um, tankers and freighters and ATBs, and we've closed fixed gear, you know, closed the lobster gear. We've in implemented a 10 knot speed limit, and we're going to do an experiment during the closed time when the right whales were there. You know, even even if I, I understand the risk is very low and I understand that we're trying to test this new technology, but why would we test this new technology during the season when the right whales are there? Why aren't we testing it when the right whales aren't there? So there's a 0% chance of interaction with right whales. Thank you. Mr. Chair, I'm not seeing any other hands raised. I'll bring the agenda back up for you. Atlantic Mackerel Management, please. Who's got this one? I do, Mr. Chair. This is Melanie. Thank you, Melanie. You're recognized. You. I'm just going to wait for Jared to pull up the presentation. Okay. Uh, Were you on that informational hearing, Melanie? I was on both of them, yeah. Yeah, the second night was much better than the first night because they had Brandon Muffy and somebody else from the council giving Jason a lot of help. Yeah, there were there were some good constructive comments, and it was uh, Ron, you know, Jared, uh, Jason had some help, and uh, I think he also was able to take some of the comments from the first night and kind of re redo some of the slides and information. So that was, I agree. Um, anyways. Um, so I'm, I'm going to provide just a high level update on the Atlantic Mackerel rebuilding action uh, for the full commission. Uh, we can t I'll take any questions at the end. Uh, staff, DMF staff have continued to have some in-depth discussions following input of the commission's Atlantic Mackerel working group that met a few weeks back. There is no action required by the commission at this time However, um, you know, members may wish to discuss additional feedback that can be relayed to the Mid-Atlantic or potential measures for state waters. Next slide. So rebuilding background for the full commission, this all began with a recent 2021 Atlantic mackerel assessment that concluded mackerel continued to be overfished with overfishing occurring. And that same conclusion from the 2017 assessment 
had led to initiation of a rebuilding plan back in 2019 that is set to conclude in 2023. Unfortunately, poor recruitment and less than predicted productivity from, I think it was a 2015 year class, uh, put the mid Atlantic Council on notice that they weren't making adequate rebuilding progress. So without spending the rest of the day digging into the assessment, I just wanna pull out the major headlines. The bar and line figure shows overall declines in SSB and recruitment. SSB is shown in the bars and recruitment is the line. Both continue to remain depressed. The chart to the right shows changes in the egg survey. Most notably, I would, I would say is the loss of spawning in the mid-Atlantic region. And then also of note, but not illustrated here is the truncated age structure. There's very few individuals older than age five, whereas ages six plus have uh, in, in the recent past comprised more than 50% of the population. So all of this is to say that the peer reviewed science paints a poor picture of Atlantic mackerel health right now. And so the Mid-Atlantic has reacted by initiating an amendment to revise its rebuilding plan and um, at, at its request, NIMS has taken a couple interim steps to help reduce mortality. And last year, 2021, the trip limit was reduced in season to the 5,000 pound incidental limit. And then this year fi uh, for fishing year 2022, the commercial catch limit has already been reduced. This is referred to as the domestic annual harvest or the DAH. And it was reduced to um, 4, 000, just over 4,500 metric tons uh, which basically constrains the total catch in 2022, or excuse me, the commercial catch in 2022 to what was caught in 2021. Next slide. <clears throat> so it was towards the end of last year that the states of Mass, Maine, and New Hampshire were pulled into the discussion. Um, and this is really because most of the recreational catch occurs in the state waters of, of those three states. So the council wrote to request a 50% reduction in recreational catch. And the state submitted a joint letter outlining several concerns, including process. And that led to those informational um, webinars. You know, New England fishermen aren't well represented on the Mid-Atlantic Council, at least certainly not recreational. There is some uh, commercial representation on the AP um, and haven't been involved with much of the previous rebuilding efforts uh, that were most impactful on the commercial fishing. So, at the state's request, the MID held those informational webinars last week, and those were really geared at providing scientific background and to gather initial input. This is all prior to formal public hearings that will be held in April. So both, both the state letter and public comment uh, brought forward several concerns, including you know, uncertainty around possible distributional shifts. Um, clearly there's local abundance in Massachusetts waters, but unfortunately the shifts in timing of the bottom trawl survey really confound it as a source to evaluate that hypothesis. There have been some exploratory egg surveys that speak against any shift in the Northern stock boundary, um, but DMF staff, we, we've been meeting to try and look at what we could bring to that question and some analyses to help inform this discussion, both in the short term and for the 2023 assessment. None of that is ready for today but um, certainly should be some, some fodder for future discussion uh, by, the, by the working group. Uh, MRIP, you know, wherever MRIP is involved, there's always questions about the validity of the data. Um, certainly some questions about how well MRIP documents bait use. Uh, in, since the informational webinars, uh, Jason Didden and various state staff have verified that there is a very specific scripted question that is asked by interviewers. I think some of the disconnect is that you know, that question, that target of the question are the anglers themselves, not any charter boat captains. Um, another source of, um, you know, disconnect between the, the science and uh, the, the fishing public is that 100% mortality assumption used in the assessment. And this really doesn't help support buy-in from a public that observes less than that, right, for discarded fish. And then equity, of course, is always a central theme. The Mid-Atlantic's actions to date, in particular reaching out to states to address recreational catch is largely you know, driven from this desire to equitably distribute the rebuilding burden. But what is equitable is always in the eye of the beholder. Um, you know, maybe it's equity and reduction, which often will mean having similar percent reductions in catch. 
uh, or it's, as we heard at the uh, informational webinars, what about the consideration of equity in terms of economic impact? So certainly this is gonna continue to be debated and drive discussions right on down to, to final action. And then finally, in terms of some of the input and, and um, concerns we've heard to date, you know, we don't wanna lose sight of the actual management responses should we find ourselves needing to enact recreational cuts. And to date, this has really come down to two possibilities, closure periods and a bag limit. DMS staffer, um, again, we've been talking about both of these and we're, we're looking at analyzing some information that can speak to, to both those, but particularly the bag limit. Uh, and we'll be meeting with a larger internal um, DMF group to, to talk through you know, a possible regulatory straw man. So why don't we transition to the upcoming timeline and what one can expect for the process. Uh, this timeline on this slide really documents key dates for the Mid-Atlantic Rebuilding Amendment. At the next New England Council meeting, uh, which is February 1st, uh, or I think it's the 2nd and 4th, um, there will be a Mid-Atlantic staff presentation to allow for additional input and questions at the council level. Uh, I'll be on an executive committee meeting in about half an hour for the council meeting, and uh, I'll probably be raising a few of these questions, including looking at expanded AP membership to include New England rec interests. Uh, then we've got the February 14th Mid-Atlantic Mackerel Committee, I'm newly one of two New England Council representatives. Eric Reed is the other. So while we don't have a seat at the full council, uh, there is um, full participation by the, well, I don't wanna say full participation, but there's voting at the committee level by New England representatives. Then in March, the MIDS uh, Science and Statistical Committee, SSC will meet to decide on upcoming mackerel catch limits and then public hearings will be held on the rebuilding amendment in April. Those hopefully will be in person and we're certainly working with the Mid-Atlantic staff to include several Massachusetts hearing locations. I think we may be hosting up in our Gloucester lab and uh, we've talked about Plymouth locations in New Bedford. Um, and I'll, I'll certainly be passing along information on those public hearings as they're finalized. Mm -hmm. I presume at least one additional committee meeting would occur before final action by the Mid-Atlantic Council, which they're still scheduling for June. So what does this all mean for Massachusetts? Uh, since the MSC Atlantic Mackerel Working Group meeting, uh, I've mentioned that DMS staff have continued to discuss uncertainties and data gaps and possible measures. And right now um, that includes those analyses I mentioned about helping to inform the debate about a stock shift versus declining productivity as well as looking at potential recreational measures. Um, there'll be more on those later. And um, I think we're also talking internally maybe about how we can improve the process and better representation, which I mentioned AP membership, but may also include things like the Mackerel Monitoring Committee. Uh, next slide, Jared. So next steps today, again, there's no action needed by the commission. Uh, I really just hope this gave you a better understanding where we are right now. I'm guessing that we'll be looking to schedule another working group meeting in the near future, but I'll leave that to um, Director McKiernan and you, Mr. Chair. And with that, um, that, that is my update on Atlantic Mackerel. Questions for Melanie? Not seeing any hands raised, Mr. Chair. Yeah, Melanie, I have one question. Can you go back to your second slide or Jared, go back to this, uh, right there? Uh, no, let's go back. Uh, no, distribution. Let's go back to that white. No, distribution. White, right there. Nope. One with a letter, Jared, I think. Right there, so, distributional yeah. shift versus productivity decline. Uh, Melanie, I think the world of both you and Nicola, and you probably need to sit down with Nicola. She can give you a fine understanding of the Mid-Atlantic Council. And they just don't believe in a distributional shift because they're always concerned about their own state quotas. But anyways, I think that's a fine conversation you could have with uh, Nicola, thank you. 
Mike Piernock. Michael. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Melanie, for your presentation. And Ray, I couldn't agree more. There, we have so many examples of climatic shift from right whales to, to lobster, to black sea bass, to bonito, to mackerel, to bluefish, to schooly bluefin. I, I'm The preponderance of evidence that uh, we see up here is a result of such, uh, uh, I would hope that at some point the, the light would be seen and, and we could uh, address these shifting stocks accordingly. Um, Melanie, uh, a question for you. Uh, I noted during their presentations that they indicated that the commercial excessal value is approximately three to four million. There was no numbers provided at the estimated uh, uh, economic value of the recreational fishery, which is significant because uh, these live line mackerel are used for not only striped bass, but um, for bluefin, um, as well as for commercial bluefin. So uh, there's a significant value there that I have not heard. One question, uh, I, I, so I'm not sure if you have the answer to that question or they're, they're still looking into it. There was an, also another question that where does, does do, where, what's done with this fish? I understand a small percentage of it commercially is used for sushi, but the vast majority of it goes overseas. Uh, I would like to know where into whom, as there's a rumor mill out there of where they may be going, and I, I would only respond accordingly to where they actually are going. So I'm not sure if you have the answers to those questions. Thank you. Yeah, Mike, I, um, certainly I don't have immediate responses for you, but I, I would be happy to look into those and I can follow up with you. Thank you, Melanie, and I appreciate your help, DMF's help in the adjacent states of New Hampshire and Maine that. Uh, are uh, on top of this. Thank you. Mr. Chair, I'm not seeing any further hands raised. Uh, we're going to ask, uh, Melody has a hard noon stop time. So we're gonna ask to switch 5C and 5D so she can cover the council updates. Yeah, I would like, I would like to thank Melanie for her presentation. And yes, we can we can switch those to accommodate Melanie's uh, schedule. Appreciate All right, that. Melanie, you're up on the council. Thank you, Jared. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, so I'll provide a report of New England Fishery Management Council activities since the November 10th uh, commission meeting and today. Uh, during that time, the council held its December meeting as well, I'll pre preview the February council meeting coming up and update commission members on a few regional fishery issues. Next slide. So spiny dogfish, uh, the council did vote to increase the trip limit of 7,500 pounds. I won't spend much more time on that since Nick covered it with the public hearing agenda item. I'll come back to it under um, the management priority for just an additional item. Groundfish, the council approved framework 63, which we talked about a little bit in terms of Georgia's bank cod rec measures. This was the framework that revised the fishing year 2022 all the way out to 2024 specifications for several stocks. Um, and I think I'd mentioned, but despite NOAA putting the council on notice that inad inadequate progress is being made on Gulf of Maine cod and Southern New England mid-Atlantic winter flounder rebuilding, the council really prioritized Georgia's bank cod measures in this, in this action. Those other stocks will certainly be a priority going forward. Um, uh, I'll, I'll move on. We talked about Georgia's bank cod, so I'll skip over that. Um, scallops, in approving framework 34, the council updated the catch limits based on updated surveys and biomass projections. And this is the framework that's being implemented in concert with the previously approved Amendment 21, which means that, that this is now incorporating the Northern Gulf of Maine biomass and fishery more comprehensively into the overall fishery and management structure. The fishery outside of the Northern Gulf of Maine has continued its focus away from the Mid-Atlantic and onto Georgia's Bank with access area trips for the upcoming year allocated to closed area two and the Nantucket Lightship South area. In terms of management priorities, uh, Georgia's Bank Cod uh, is a multi-year one where we'll see this year probably a uh, white paper on allocation 
that will inform uh, a multi-year priority to set a Georgia's Bank recreational COD catch limit and accountability measures. Right now, we just have a catch target, which, which differs. Um, other priorities include scoping of scallop fishery, limited access leasing of days at sea and access area allocations. And then uh, just touching back on spiny dogfish, the council did approve uh, doing a framework adjustment under the lead of the Mid-Atlantic to develop possible additional changes to the trip limit. Those are just highlights of the management priorities. There's certainly a ton more. Um, and if any council members or commission, excuse me, commission members want to speak more with me on those, I'm happy to just give me a, a call or email. Uh, next slide, Jared. So in terms of the February outlook, uh, unfortunately, once again, we'll be meeting remotely by webinar. There will be two final actions of note. One is on skates framework nine. This is a significantly pared down action from the original amendment and it's uh, seeking really just to revise uh, a few FMP objectives and provide some conditions uh, around renewal of open access federal skate fishing permits. Groundfish, uh, the, the committee met yesterday and recommended a modified proposal out of the recreational advisory panel and that would allow for a five week fall directed cod season in addition to the existing spring season. Uh, a, a 22 to 28 inch slot limit that would be consistent with the recommended measures for Georgia's bank cod and maintain the one fish cod limit. The Gulf of Maine haddock measures that are being recommended out of committee are largely status quo, except for an increase to the 20 fish bag limit. So this still has to go to the full council. And then again, the process is the council's really just recommending these two um, to NIMS and NIMS has the final say on what gets implemented. So that I would stay tuned on what's gonna happen with Gulf of Maine Cod and Haddock. Next slide. The other uh, discussions and updates of note for the February council meeting for Groundfish, we will receive a final report of the Atlantic Cod Stock Structure Workshops and a progress report from the Atlantic Cod Research Track Working Group. The council will have an opportunity to discuss potential adjustments for management purposes. Recall this kind of has a two prong approach where uh, it's being discussed as part of the research track. So what, what it means in terms of um, what the scientific units should be for the assessments, but then also we have to grapple with, well, what, how do we wanna alter the units for management? And it's not necessarily, it doesn't necessarily have to be the, the same. Uh, scallops, they will receive a final report on evaluating rotational management. This is, um, this document is really giving us a lay of the land of where we've been with rotational management and how it's evolved over the years. And this really sets the council up to make adjustments and improvements. Um, there'll, there'll be a bunch of um, recommendations coming out of that and the committee will, engage, will be engaging in that. Uh, to really jump off uh, in terms of where what we do in the next few years. You know, things are pretty dynamic in the scallop fishery. Um, in terms of the scallop ace leasing priority, the, the council and the committees will be engaging in the next uh, month or two on, a, on finalizing a scoping document. And then the hearings themselves should be this summer, I'm guessing May, June with any final recommendations on whether to pursue limited access leasing in time for uh, the September meeting where we discuss annual priorities. Uh, lastly, in terms of the February meeting, there is talk about developing a Southern New England habitat area of particular concern. The habitat PDT has been discussing this uh, and this kind of comes out of uh, concerns about the overlap of the lone cod spawning aggregation in southern New England and offshore wind development. Next slide. The additional updates, uh, we'll get that Atlantic mackerel briefing from Mid-Atlantic staff. Um, and there will be some updates on the East Coast Climate Change Scenario Planning Initiative. This uh, update will summarize August, September webinars that introduce the scenario planning to stakeholders, and it'll outline next steps, including um, information about February and March webinars that are looking to explore the physical, biological, and socioeconomic drivers and uncertainties 
about how um, climate change may be impacting the marine ecosystem. One thing I don't have listed here that is coming up next week is the Haddock Research Track Assessment. And my understanding is that this will focus just on Gulf of Maine Haddock with Georges Bay Haddock delayed somewhat, but it'll still be happening this winter. So for those interested, I'll certainly send along the link to the assessment webinar and the data portal. And uh, that pretty much is it for my update on New England Council, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Melanie, for a very comprehensive report. And I, I can speak on behalf of probably all the commission members. We think you're doing a fantastic job at your post on the council. So thank you very much. Are there any questions for Melanie before she has to get off to another meeting? Yeah. Yeah. Well, Ray, I would just like to add to Melanie's report, uh, just a side uh, sidelight here, and that is we have an open period for the public to uh, reach out to us to apply for uh, a council vacancy, which will be uh, Mike Sissenwine's uh, seat that will be vacated uh, this August. And so um, if, if anybody's interested in applying for a New England council seat, we are accepting um, applications. So Melanie, do you any, anything you wanna to add to that? No, thanks. I, I did omit that, so I appreciate bringing that up. Okay. Thanks. Thank you, Melanie. Okay, we can move along here, Jared. I'm not seeing any other hands raised on that, Mr. Chair. We can move along to the ASMSC. Uh, updates from the ASMSC. Nicola. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Jared, I'll bring up a presentation, but this is going to cover um, some updates from meetings that occurred in December um, that included the lobster board, the fluke scup sea bass and bluefish board, and the northern shrimp sections meetings. And also I'll give a, like a quick preview of what's um, on the agenda for next week's ASMC meeting. Um, the lobster board met early in December, and the outcome of that was the approval of the draft addendum 29, um, which looks at an electronic vessel tracking requirement for federal um, permit holders to better characterize the, the spatial and temporal um, effort data of the, of the fisheries. Um, you know, this responds to the, the challenges and data needs um, for um, issues such as the you know, right whales, uh, wind energy de development and so on. And so um, we actually had, um, the last hearing was held last night. It was a joint virtual hearing for Mass in Rhode Island, um, but public comment is still being accepted um, through January 31st for anyone that is interested to um, voice their opinion on, on the option in here, which would include a, a a vessel tracking requirement. Um, Dan, is there anything that you want to add about the the hearing that took place last night? Uh, no, it is available, you know, to be seen, you know, as a recorded, uh, you know, webinar. Uh, pretty good attendance, and um, you know, it was uh, it was interesting to have a joint Rhode Island Mass uh, meeting because it is for federal permit holders, and so it kind of makes sense to do it across states. Overall, I thought it was a good uh, good informative meeting. Okay, so moving forward, that's, um, this won't be an action item at next week's ASMC board meeting, but there'll be a, a special um, board meeting held outside of the normal quarterly meeting schedule to um, take final action on this and um, determine the implementation date, which, um, you know, uh, has to be coordinated with, with NOAA Fisheries as well and um, needs to be determined still. Um, so the next the next meeting was a joint meeting with the Mid Atlantic Council to address uh, fluke scup sea bass and bluefish. Um, next slide. And um, the first final action was taken on the um, commercial recreational sector allocation amendment. Um, and this amendment um, looked at options to consider revising the historical base years upon which the, the annual catch limit is allocated between the commercial and recreational fishery for these three species. And those options primarily you know, looked at more recent years data, the last five, last 10, or last 15 years of, of catch and landings data in order to um, revise the allocations. The outcome was that the 
historical base years were maintained as the reference period for these allocations, but they were updated um, with some improved data, um, including both the recalibrated MRIP recreational harvest and um, catch estimates um, for those time periods. Um, as And for SCUP, there was also um, some improved uh, commercial discard uh, data from the time period that was incorporated. Um, the um, allocations for all three of them are now uh, set as a catch-based allocation. So that means that the allocations themselves were determined based on all of the, the catch data from the reference period, not just the landings data. And that when the specifications are made, um, the uh, ACL is um, allocated according to the, the allocation and, and then um, discards are removed, which makes essentially each sector more responsible for its own discards and not penalized by the other sector's um, discards. <clears throat> so the table here shows um, the shift that occurred for each species. Um, and all of them, because of the, the increase in, in the recreational harvest estimates from the reference periods, it, it transitions more allocation to the, the recreational fisheries. Um, for fluke from 40% recreational to 45, scup from 22% recreational to 35, and black sea bass 51% recreational to 55%. Um, because for, for fluke and, and sea bass, this also was a transition from a landings-based allocation to a catch-based allocation. It makes it um, kind of difficult to understand what this really means in terms of our, um, our quotas. And so the next three slides that I'll go through um, provide some graphs that were included in the amendment and provide an example, which I wanna stress is just an example of what the 2023 commercial quota and recreational harvest limit could be under the new um, allocations, which are expected to be implemented next year. So um, the, the quotas and, and harvest limits for this year are unchanged, and this is expected to go into effect next year. So starting with um, fluke, there's a lot going on here, um, but um, each of the graphs here, commercial on the left and recreational on the right, it provides the landings information for the three fisheries, uh, for the fisheries in, in the gray bars and um, up to 2019. And then each of the lines across is an example of what the commercial quota um, and recreational harvest limit would be under each of the options that was considered by the board and the council. Um, so looking at the left for fluke, the um, quota for 2023 under the current allocation is 15.53 million pounds and a kind of a best guess as to what it might be next year um, using the selected option, which is the red line there is 15.14 million pounds. And that's, so that's a 3% decrease. So um, these example quotas and recreational harvest limits um, again, use just a projection of what the discards could be, not the actual discard estimates that will be used in the calculations of the quotas. And that's why these numbers are just examples. Um, but you can see that for, for the, on the commercial fishery for fluke, the landings are um, in recent years and as well as in 2020 and 2021 are under the, the quota, what, is it, what it is expected to be next year. For the recreational fishery, um, the, the status quo is shown at 10.36 million pounds for 2023, and it may increase, you know, roughly 7% to a little bit over 11 million pounds um, for 2023, which um, is above the, the recent year landings in 2018 and 2019, um, right about where they were in 2020, um, and the, the 2021 harvest estimate for for fluke um, right now is coming in pretty low based on a, a, a you know an early projection based on only partial year data um, and would be underneath uh, that harvest limit for 2023. <clears throat> on the next slide, we'll see the same um, slides for SCUP. Uh, on the commercial side, 
the um, quota for 2023 is currently set at 17.87 million pounds and um, may decline to about 14 million pounds, a 21% decline um, under the selected option, which is shown in the, in the yellow line. Um, and that will be bringing down the quota right around to where the landings have been in the last couple of years, um, as well as um, and, and above the 2020 and, and preliminary 2021 harvest estimates. So the, the scuff fishery, you know, also similar to fluke, may not be constrained by these um, this allocation amendment. Um, on the recreational side, the, the status quo um, gray line there of 5.41 million pounds is well below what the recreational landings have been in recent years. And the under the new allocation, um, we'll be moving up to the yellow line around 9 million pounds, a 67% increase, you know, notal, notably for the, you know, a slide that I'm going to talk about a couple down the road here, you know, that quota is still, uh, or the recreational harvest limit is still well below what the landings have been in recent years, um, including the preliminary estimate for 2021 of, of 14, around 14 million pounds. And for black sea bass on the commercial side, the current 2023 commercial quota, the brown line is 5.71 million pounds and um, will decline to about maybe four and a half million pounds, a 20% reduction under this um, allocation amendment. That is still above the, the 2018 and 2019 landings um, and um, close the, the 2020 and 2021 landings after the quotas were increased did, did also increase, but are still, um, we're still below the potential quota for, for 2023. And on the recreational side, the RHL for 2023, currently 5.95 million pounds, may increase about 21% to over 7 million pounds for next year. And similar to SCUP, um, while an increase that's still below the recent year's landings, um, and the, you know, the 2021 preliminary harvest estimate for for black sea bass is is you know closer to 12 million pounds so it's it's double what the the rhl could be for um 2023 so again these are just examples but i you know i think it's helpful to um kind of kind of see what the the impact could be for for the fisheries when this is implemented in in 2023 so the, the other discussion um, at the Mid-Atlantic Council and ASMC was for the setting of the recreational measures for, for this year, for 2022. Next slide, please. Um, and this covered um, bluefish as well as fluke scup and sea bass. And this is the, you know, the annual process where um, we uh, review the landings information from the last couple of years and um, compare that to the recreational harvest limit uh, for the coming year and determine whether a coastwide liberalization or reduction is necessary. And in the case of bluefish, um, the recent landings are you know, right on par with what the harvest limit is for this year, even though it is, you know, the harvest limit itself was increased, but the landings, you know, were already coming in at that level. And so the coastwide measures will be status quo um, which for Massachusetts will mean again, the, the full year fishery, the three fish limit for shore or private vessel anglers, uh, the five fish limit uh, aboard for four higher vessels and, and no minimum size. It gets a little bit more complicated when we get into fluke scup and sea bass though. So for fluke, um, the recreational harvest limit was increased. And while the 2021 landings are coming in um, well below that, the landings the last four years under status quo measures have been highly variable. And so uh, the monitoring committee used an average of the 2018 to 2021 landings um, to um, use that as kind of the projected harvest under status quo rules for this year, which would have allowed a um, a 33% liberalization, but there is, you know, some concern about the variability in the harvest estimates for this stock that um, uh, the 
2018 year class, I believe it is, is going to be recruiting to the fishery. Um, and so a more cautionary approach of allowing a 16.5% regional liber liberalization was selected for fluke. Um, regarding fluke management, Massachusetts is considered its own region. So we would be looking to um, you know, develop options that will would allow a 16.5% liberalization. Um, the monitoring committee you know, recommended that, that states and regions you know, look at their size limits as a focus for this liberalization if they plan to take it. Um, so last year we were May 23rd to October 9th, five fish and 17 inches for the minimum size. For SCUP, um, the RHL is, is, is um, pretty much the same as the prior year, but the landings are more than double the recreational harvest limit um, in recent years. And so that resulted in a need for a 56% coastwide liberalization. Um, however, um, because there is um, commercial quota under utilization and the SCUP resources, you know, twice its biomass target, the Council and Commission decided on an approach that would um, result in an estimated 33% harvest reduction, and that would be for each state um, and the federal waters um, size limit to go up one inch. So we are right now we're at nine inches. So this would be, be moving our um, size limit up to 10 inches, which is where we were a couple of years ago. Um, we went down to nine inches based on the strength of the um, 2015 year class, which was the highest um, ever estimated. And, and as that year class is aging, um, this, you know, this increase to 10 inches makes some sense with regard with, with regard to that. Um, NIMFS did say at the, the meeting, the regional administrator did say that because the council and commission were only acting to take half of the reduction that was needed, um, this may result in um, NIMFS closing federal waters for recreational scup harvest. Um, most of our scup harvest recreationally in Massachusetts does come from state waters. So the impact of that action would be less here than it may be in other um, more Southern states where more of the recreational fishery occurs in, in federal waters. For black sea bass, um, the recreational harvest limit is slightly increased. However, the, the landings um, from 2018 to 2021 where there's been status quo measures have averaged 9.4 million pounds, um, you know, well above the 6.7 million pound RHL. And so that resulted in a need for a 28% coastwide reduction. Um, how that, and, and, and also for, for sea bass, we work in a, in a regional management system for the recreational regulations. So Massachusetts through New York is a region and um, coming out of Next week's meeting, we would be working with our region to determine that 20, how we would um, achieve that 28% reduction within our state, uh, within our region. My, sorry, it, it doesn't mean that each state would be taking the same reduction, but within the region, that's what has to be taken. Um, and uh, there is, you know, our, our regulations last year are shown here, May 18 to September 8, five fish and 15 inch minimum size. Uh, next slide. I, yeah, so just highlighting, oh, go back one actually, Jared. Thank you. So that 28% that that's shown there for the, for the coastwide sea bass reduction, um, since this decision was made, the, the technical committee has been meeting and reviewing the recent year's recreational data and um, looking for, um, you know, evaluating that data, seeing if there may be um, outliers in the data. So uh, it's possible that that 28% may be reduced to a lower reduction necessary. Um, and I think information on that is gonna be presented next week. Um, so, so just to, that 28% may be revised downward. Um, but the, the plan would have been that next week, the board would um, you know, approve uh, the methodology, you know, what type of analyses, which data are used, um, in order for fluke, uh, for, in order for fluke and sea bass, um, for us to work within our regions to determine what the measures uh, you know, would be for next for this year. Um, 
However, the the need to cut scup and black sea bass is, is obviously challenging given that these stocks are both at um, twice their, their biomass target. And, um, you know, that, that has brought about some discussions that while not on next week's meeting for the ASMFC are going to be talked about at the joint meeting between the council, the Mid-Atlantic Council and the ASMFC in February. Next slide. Um, so, you know, the, the problem with our current management system for these species is that we're only looking at what the recent year's harvest has been and comparing it to um, the RHL in the coming year. And there's, you know, been interest to take into consideration additional information to determine when do we really need to take a cut for one of these species, you know, given sea basses, um, abundance right now, a, a, you know, a, a positive recruitment trend. Um, uh, do we really need to take a cut? And so that's where the harvest control rule addendum comes in. This is something that's currently under development. Um, and what this table is showing are, um, you know, the four different options that have been developed for a harvest control rule and um, that would take into consideration additional information in order to set the recreational measures. Um, currently, this addendum is not expected to be ready for um, approval and implementation until next year at the earliest. Um, there's still work being done to develop the options, and three of them also rely on um, this external model to help set um, these predetermined management measures that would be associated with, you know, how you kind of bin the stock status and, and whether you have to take a cut or not. There's this one option, uh, hit next slide, Jared, it's just gonna highlight this percent change approach here is one that does not re rely on that external model being um, completed and providing those predetermined measures. And so there has been interest raised by certain um, council and commission members to potentially pull that one option out of this addendum and fast track it for implementation this year, um, such that when um, Garfo goes to publish it, its final rule about what the measures would be this year, it could say, you know, based on the implementation of the harvest control, this harvest control rule and the stock status that um, we could actually be at status quo management for all three species. Next slide. So this, this table kind of describes how that, that one option works, but um, you know, essentially what it does is it, it, it ends up putting fluke and scup and black sea bass into this, you know, a bin, a stock status bin kind of that would allow for a status quo. So there, this is these, this is really kind of um, early in the consideration of, of this approach. Um, like I said, it's gonna be. Um, the Mid-Atlantic Council just posted its agenda yesterday, but it does include in that agenda the option to, to maybe pull out this particular approach and try to get it implemented in time that we could have status quo measures for all three species. You know, notably, that would mean giving up um, the liber liberalization for fluke, and um, it would also you know, kind of potentially be locking us into to status quo measures for, for several years while those other approaches are still developed, um, those more model developed approaches, which I think have more of a potential to, um, uh, you know, in, in potentially improve the equitability of the regulations along the coast. So there, there while this, it sounds really great, um, you know, that we could potentially avoid these cuts for scup and black sea bass. I think there are some other considerations that really need to be evaluated. And the, the FMAT, the PDT will be presenting at the February meeting, um, how realistic it really is that we could have this one approach, you know, ready in time to be implemented this year. So this, this is all kind of a preliminary discussion and I'm sure there'll be more to be brought forward to the, um, this commission um, on the on this issue pretty soon. Are there any oh um, northern shrimp? I guess the so moving on to northern shrimp. The section met um, 
also in December and um, continued the harvest moratorium for, for shrimp through 2024. Um, another three year, like a three year extension. Um, this graph is just showing you the continued um, uh, low levels of the, the, the standardized indices that are used to assess the Northern shrimp stock. Um, next slide. And looking ahead to next week's meeting, um, there's gonna be likely you know, three um, documents that are gonna be approved for, for public hearings. So um, you'll wanna be on the lookout for um, lobster draft addendum 27, um, which looks at um, measures to increase protection of spawning stock in the Gulf of Maine and Georgia's bank stock. Um, striped bass draft amendment seven um, is expected to be approved for public comment and that's going to be looking at the management triggers, the rebuilding plan, how we use conservation equivalency in the management plan, um, measures to um, reduce recreational release mortality and increase the protection on recent strong year classes. Additionally, Menhaden draft addendum one um, will likely be approved and that looks at the, the commercial state by state allocations, um, the episodic, ascent set aside, episodic event set aside program and um, that incidental catch and small scale fishery provision that allows um, 6,000 pounds after a state's quota has been exhausted. Um, and as previously covered, there is expected to be final action on the spiny dogfish northern region trip limit, um, which we'll have to respond to um, in our state if we want to um, increase the trip limit here. And I think that's the last slide. So any questions? Thank you, Nicola, for your presentation. Questions from the commission members? Mike here enough. Michael, you recognize. Thank you. Can you hear me? Barely. You're faint, yeah. Um, I lost power. I got back on. I'm not sure how I'm on, but uh, thank you, Nicola. Um, there's a lot going on. I appreciate all that you and the staff are doing to address these multiple issues. Uh, I mean, as you know, we're, we're, we are concerned about the Black Sea bass and scup and summer flounder. And, uh, you know, it's just another example of uh, with black sea bass, these other species of shifting stocks. We have more fish in our waters, yet our seasons and bag limits are not consistent with such. And that's, that's no doing of you. It's the doing of the rest of the Atlantic States Marine Fishery Commission that are trying to hold on to their quotas. And it, it, it's outright disturbing now with where we if, if there is no change to uh, the, the quotas that were just established for these species, that uh, we're going to go backwards with black sea bass. So I appreciate your efforts with the RHL. And um, I agree, we need to vet it out and, and see what the benefits and disadvantages of them are. I, I hope it's ultimately of benefit so we don't go in the other direction with black sea bass as far as the, the seasons to the bag limits. Um, in addition, um, with the northern shrimp, uh, if, if it'd be possible uh, beyond this phone, well, beyond this meeting, if I could be forwarded I, uh, details concerning the shift of that stock over time uh, due to uh, increased temperatures and so on. I'm not sure whether that information is available, uh, but I, I would like to see how that has worked for northern shrimp in comparison to mackerel and all these other species that are their examples. So does that, does that exist uh, to be able to forward that information to me? I think the, the, the stock assessment would be um... A starting point, and there was also a, a study recently um, out of Maine that that um, looked at that, that surmises. Mike might be able to help me here, but the um, about uh, predator prey, um, the the effect of on, of of the district. The pardon me, the distribution changing of. Um, 
other stocks and predator prey dynamics that are related to northern shrimp's um, low levels. So that would be an, another good one to, to forward you. Thank you. If you get that to me, uh, it'd be greatly appreciated. Uh, and, and good luck with all of this. You, Dan, Ray, everybody, thank you. Aaron? Not seeing any other comments, Mr. Chair. Thank you very much, Nicola. I presume you're done, and I guess uh, we'll be chatting next week. All right, moving along here, other business. Uh, Commission member comments. Michael Piernock. I'm good, thank you. Suki Sawyer. All set, Ray, thanks. Tim Brady. All set, Ray, thank you. Lou Williams. Uh, yeah, Ray, just one thing. Uh, I've been getting, <clears throat> I've seen a few guys, a uh, handful of guys they're trying to get the gear in and uh, it's generally guys with smaller boats and they're doing the best they can. And they just, you know, they, they might run over the, the line, um, which I just hope of course, but it doesn't take a heavy hand to it, especially on the North shore where the, uh, where these whales aren't here in February. Um, but you know, they're trying their best for the weather change there after the first of the year. And, uh, just, just, just saying, you know, have a little consideration on the enforcement end of that. Thanks. Shelly Edmondson. No comments. Thanks, Ray. No Amaru. All set, Ray. Leah Bogdan. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I have a couple of um, quick comments. Uh, first of all, uh, I'd like to say how much I enjoyed my visit to the uh, reacquired Cat Cove lab and facility in Salem. Michael Armstrong, um, who's heading out, I guess, that renovation and a takeover of it. Um, I had a chance to meet with him a couple of weeks ago and he gave me a tour of the facility. If you haven't seen it, it really is quite an impressive, impressive uh, place. Uh, it was owned by, it was, uh, I guess it was originally owned by uh, someone's, uh, someone's talking over me. So, I did. okay. Any case, uh, apparently it was owned by the state or DMF and then given to, uh, under a letter of authorization, given or there was a letter of authorization after it was given to Salem State College when they no longer wanted it, it would come back to DMF. And uh, if you have a chance, you really should get down there and see it. Uh, it's, I think it's going to be a real jewel uh, once, once it's up and running. And so the research that's going to go on there, I think, is going to be very beneficial to marine fisheries in general. That's number one. Number two, um, back in December, at the December or at the November meeting, I asked Jared if he would send me on, send to me uh, the annual report. And he's, he did email us, all of us on December 2nd uh, of 21, the annual report for, uh, for DMF. Uh, and I had a chance to go through it. Obviously it, got, it was a hundred and some pages, so I didn't read everything word for word, but I did go through the entire document. I need to say it's quite an impressive document. And if, you, and if the other commission members haven't seen it, open up that December second uh, link that's in the, the the link that's in the December second um, email that Jared sent, and um, take a look at it. There's a lot of great information in there. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Bill Doyle. Bill, closing comment. I guess Bill Doyle's gone. I'm sorry. I um I thought I was unmuted. I uh, just one quick comment, Ray. Um, yeah. I I really take the um no change in status of the squid regulation today as a real vote of confidence for the director. Thank you. Thank you, Bill. Thanks, Bill. <laughs> okay. Now public comment, Jared. Members of the public, uh, that's the opportunity. If you have a comment, uh, you can raise your hand. I'll recognize you one by one, and uh, we can take your comments. I'm not seeing any members of the public with their hands raised, Mr. Chair, so we can uh, move on to adjournment. Yeah, once again, I'll close by stating uh, 
back to life here. I appreciate the participation by our members. Uh, it's very much appreciated. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, motion to adjourn. Well, here, move to adjourn. Seconded by. Somebody please second Khalil's motion. I second. Thank Thank you. No for the second. Nobody's opposed. No objections. Meeting is adjourned. Thank you.